All right, so first let's do a bit of a found bit section here to talk about one thing in particular that was once unused, but has now finally been implemented as many of you have been leaving comments about this since chapter three dropped. And this is of course the huggy image that was left over unused way back in chapter one of this game, which has seemingly been reused for the hallucination huggy VHS tape in the nightmare segment of Home Sweet Home. When looking at them side by side, although definitely similar, we can see that they touched up the one that ended up being used here in Chapter 3 with the eyes looking different, and there being a lot less teeth, namely on the bottom of Huggy's mouth in the final one. And interestingly enough, the original Huggy image, now renamed to Huggy Scary in the files, actually once again remains unused in the files of Chapter 3. Well, mostly. We'll get into this more a bit later in this video. But in any case, really cool to see that an image left over unused in the game ended up being reused over two years later. And now getting to the good stuff here, let's check out the handful of unused maps left over in Chapter 3. Starting off small, we got Entry, and I feel like we've seen these maps several times on the series by now, but yeah, it's literally just a cube. That's it. Nothing else to say here, really. Then, since it's the first section you play in in Chapter 3, let's now go to Intro Tunnels Blockout, which covers the intro of the game up to getting in the cable car which takes you to Playcare. So here let's start in the Trash Compactor Room where we can see that at this point it's pretty empty. But I guess this makes sense since this is essentially a rough draft of the map with really basic models made to lay out how the area is planned to look. Then from here, we can go through this gap and see our first developer text of this video as looking up, we can see placeholder text for I guess what was planned to be a sign instructing employees of the area that a safety harness is required for all repairs here. Not only did the sign not end up being placed here in the final version, but this whole platform that you'd have to squeeze through here was removed too. Then moving on, we can see an early mock-up of the piston platforming section, as well as the area above where we can also see a hole in the wall similar to what was made for the final version. What's also interesting is that here there seems to be another piston platforming area on the other side of the trash compactor, and this one is actually doable here, so this definitely looks like it could have been another way to get up to the top area. Then in the upper catwalk section here, in addition to some nice yellow and blue blocks, there's this strange floating grab pack hand with a red and black texture. Now this same red and black texture is later seen in this map, seemingly as a placeholder way to show a trail of blood. So maybe this was a placeholder for a bloody grab pack hand or something? And it can actually be interacted with too, as if you pull it with the grab pack, it will like open up, seemingly letting you go back down into the trash compactor below. Now, why you'd want to go back there isn't clear, but whatever the plan for this was, it was ultimately scrapped as there's nothing really like this here in the final version of this area. Near this area, we can also find a nice chunk of developer text indicating that this room here was meant to show the player the first gruesome indication of what Nappy Cat has done to the other toys here. Oh yeah, Catnap is referred to in the game's files numerous times as Nappy Cat, so it's quite likely that Nappy Cat was the original name for the creature before ultimately being changed. Honestly, I think Catnap rolls off the tongue much better, so I think this was a good change. Anyways, the final version of this area definitely succeeded in doing what it was planned to do based on this text. Then from here, we can go to the next area, which in the final version, we got the second piston platforming section, but here there aren't any pistons yet, at least that are visible. When you do get to the other side of the section, you can start to hear some thumping noises. And it turns out that these are actually caused by some objects clapping against each other just out of bounds here. I'm not quite sure what these were for, and the sound effect almost sounds like it was just made by a person going do, 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 do. Also near these is an emergency control switch, which at first I thought that this would have made these stop or would have been controls for the compactor or something, but pulling the switch didn't seem to really do anything. Then looking to the right from the end of this area, we can get a nice view of a stiff model of Catnap just chilling here, and I guess this was a placeholder for his model that's seen crawling away here in the final version. It honestly just looks so goofy to see him grinning like this, almost like he knows we shouldn't be seeing him in this state. 
From here, we can pull open this vent covering to then crawl through it, which is easier said than done without proper lighting. Then in the room that follows, we can see some awesome placeholder models of a fridge, a pool table, this amazing looking TV, and more. I also love that the cupboards here use like little jail cell doors as a placeholder. There's also this placeholder for a poster that reads, Huggy can keep a secret, be like Huggy. And it mentions that the employees are contractually obligated to be like Huggy. I wonder to what extent. Anyways, just to give you guys a picture of how much this room was updated from this date, here's a side by side comparison of the two. Yeah. From here, we can also see a trail of blood that was supposedly left by the player as Catnap was dragging them to the garbage chute in the chapter's intro. So we can follow it back to see a restricted access door that was just changed to what looks like an unassuming elevator here by the green hand charge point. And no, unfortunately there isn't anything cool behind these doors. The blood trail then leads us to a door with more dev text and this time, this sign was actually implemented into the final version, verbatim. In the next room, we can see an early version of the tube that Ollie sends down a battery through as well as some more basic props. There's also a little secret hidden away though, as just above this room are some cubes in four colors that would make for a sweet logo. These seem to be an early setup for a puzzle of some sort, but whatever the plan for these was, never ended up being realized. Then through this door, we finally get to the train track area, where we can first see a nice basic version of the playcare sign which was used to tease this chapter back at the end of chapter 2, which oddly doesn't make an appearance in this game. And then there's also this big train crash here. Huh, <laughs> more like big octagonal prism crash, am I right? There's also instruction here to add particle effects to make it seem like the tunnels are at risk of collapsing, and I don't think this was something they really ended up doing here. Then moving on, we can see some nice rubble chunks on the tracks as we finally get to the entrance to the cable car to play care. The security room is here with only one TV rather than like 15, and so is the maintenance room. And although there isn't a placeholder power puzzle here yet, there is what looks to be an early model of a VHS tape. So it looks like originally there was a plan to have one of those in here as well. Then after passing the awesome looking low poly trees going up the stairs, we can see an early logo for Elliot's Express. And then lastly for this area, near the early cable car we can see some more dev text on each side saying let's go, and then one for a watch your step warning. As far as out of bounds things here go, there's some of the usual stuff you might expect like a power puzzle, grab handle, and other random level objects here and there. But one of the weirdest things is that there's also a floating yellow Nintendo 64 controller found out of bounds here. Listed in the game's file simply as Blockout and 64 controller, found just above the vent section before the lounge room, it's unclear what exactly this epic controller in all its three-pronged glory would have been for, but someone obviously put at least a bit of extra effort into making this, and they could have made any generic looking controller, but I guess whoever made this had some good taste. And this also turns out to be one of the very few objects in this early map that you can actually grab and carry around. But yeah, unfortunately whatever the idea may have been for this seems to have been ultimately scrapped from this chapter. All in all, this map was really cool and I thought it was awesome to get a look at this area and a bunch of the placeholder models from a much earlier point in development. Then moving on, next up we have a map titled Dome Environment that's found in an archive maps folder in the game's files. And as you'd expect, this is an early version of the main playcare dome area, though obviously a bit further along in development compared to the previous map. Here we start out in the maintenance area under the statue and we can see a few notable differences. Although the strange looking generator with all the eyes is still here, this room lacks the sockets for all of the cords from the different areas around playcare, there's no chute that's used by Ollie to send you down keys, and lastly, the computer is much different compared to how it's seen in the final with this one having a bunch of small monitors instead of one bigger one. And then the main console here is just a big placeholder blue box. Then if we try going up the stairs to the main area here, we can notice that it's blocked as the grass geometry above is just straight up borked, preventing you from walking or jumping up through. But thankfully I was able to teleport across so I could explore the rest of the area to my heart's content. Although all of the main buildings here are where they should be, as you can see, the rest of the dome is 
pretty empty. The area where you come down from the cable car is also unfinished, as basically everything from it hasn't been added here at this point, and even these stairs here are not only lacking proper textures, but even any collision, as you can just walk right through them. And furthermore, although the buildings are here, they're different compared to the final versions, as unlike there, where inside there's more stuff modeled and even some rooms that you can walk in, here, they're straight up just empty, so I guess this was from a point where the developers knew where they wanted the buildings to go, but they didn't finalize how their internals would be laid out just yet. Then, in addition to these weird blue boxes that are found all over the place with no seeming function, there's what looks to be an early version of the elevator that you go up with Poppy and Kissy in the game. The signs around the statue in the middle are here, but the buttons to activate them haven't been implemented here yet. The counselor's office building has a front wall detached and is missing the first level of steps that lets you walk around the sides and such. And then, probably the most interesting thing here is that the toy store looks quite different. Unlike in the final version where it's more decrepit and blocked off, this one is much more open. And we'll talk about this a bit more later in this video, but there's extremely strong evidence that reveals that the toy store was going to be another big area that the player was planned to visit that ended up being cut from this chapter. So if you were ever wondering why the toy store seemed like a more prominent building in the dome, even being one of the bigger highlighted ones on the map, yeah, the plan was originally for it to have a much bigger role in the game. Now, while we're on the topic of the dome, I'm not going to be diving into the out-of-bounds stuff in the used maps too much here because I didn't really find anything that crazy for the most part. But, outside of the dome, I did find at least two of these orange canister things that I don't believe I've seen used anywhere else in this chapter, so I thought that was pretty neat. Oh, also, when flying around this map, I noticed something was hovering above the cable car, and it turns out it was actually a VCR player, and I guess this is how the developers got the intro message from Elliot Ludwig here to play inside. And it also appears that this is actually where the sound of the video is coming from. Although it looks a bit goofy from outside, it's quite a clever way of pulling this off. Then in the school map, just above the generator room are actually two models of Miss Delight. One of the creepy ruined one that's seen in the game, and then one of her all clean and looking brand spanking new, and I don't believe this model is ever seen used in the game, so it makes me wonder why it would be stashed way up here. In any case, it's pretty cool to see them contrasted like this, to see I guess how they were before and after the Hour of Joy. Also, I just realized this when editing this video, but the ruined version's eyes follow you wherever you go, which, thanks, I hate it. Oh, and on the note of Out of Bounds models, there's a squeezed looking catnap found Out of Bounds in the Home Sweet Home area. Just thought you should know. Now moving on, next we got a pair of early versions of the Gas Production Zone, the first of which is titled 1 Functionality Gas Production Zone Proto 3. First of all, typically maps with functionality in the name only loads parts of the map that have, well, functionality, so unfortunately we don't get the whole map here, but only some parts of it. Secondly, this file name references a Proto 3, which not only appears to reveal that this map was from a build of the game titled as such, but also suggests the existence of two more prototype builds that predated this one that are out there somewhere. My fingers are definitely crossed that hopefully one day we might get to access these. Anyways, here we get to see an incredibly early version of the Gas Production Zone, including stuff like a very early main computer, some really basic wiring around the area, some early main gas tube things with the raised one I guess indicating where the red gas was being held. We can see some early placeholders for the purple hand panels, a grab pack here I guess as a placeholder for the grab pack 2.0 where you unlock the purple hand. Then we got some power node things, as well as early elevators for the final boss fight, as well as for the ending of the game. There wasn't much else that stood out to me, but it was just really cool to see this area in an early state like this. Then next we got two blockout gas production zone proto 3, so also from the same prototype build I guess, but the two at the start I suppose suggests a second iteration here. Also, this time around, it's a blockout map, so it's much more complete looking than the previous area. From the entrance, we can see some different models for the main computer and cylinders here. There's this big lab sign, which looks like it was moved here in the final version. The section for the first purple hand puzzle platforming area is roughly put together here, though lacking any of the actual bounce pads. 
And similarly, we also have a very early makeup of the controller power puzzle room, here referred to as Control Center A. But probably the most interesting thing about the early version of this room is that it appears to reveal where the elevator at the end of the chapter might be taking us, as in this room is some big developer text reading, PRISON. Now this room itself certainly doesn't resemble a prison in the final version, so I'm willing to bet that originally the plan was for this sign to tease where the next chapter would take place, similar to how at the end of chapter 2 we saw the playcare sign. Now this sign does appear to be crudely covered up with some shapes, so perhaps it was around this point in development where the developers were deciding to scrap this sign idea to make it more of a mystery where the next chapter will go. Though in the files, there is actually a finished texture for a prison sign too, so who knows. But I am willing to bet that Chapter 4 will end up taking place in a prison area, so if this does end up getting revealed in Chapter 4, come back and let me know if I was right or wrong. Anyways, moving on, next up we have my favorite of the early maps, and probably the most interesting, an early version of the hallucination section in Home Sweet Home, referred to in the files as Dream 1, with this early version listed as Dream 1. Now here we start things off in a room much different to the one seen in the final, and not only in that it looks more basic, but we also have a fountain with water coming out of a statue of Poppy, and instead of just a creepy room, this looks like a foyer entrance of sorts with a bigger sign for Home Sweet Home. And then we also have two placeholder statues, one for Elliot Ludwig, the founder of Playtime Company, as well as Stella Graber, who is revealed to have been the head of Playcare in this chapter. I gotta say though, I love the placeholder model for these statues, they're just so chonky looking. But the real fun of this area starts once we head down the lengthy staircase here, where we can start to see some doors that don't quite line up with their frames. And then, just like in the final version of this chapter, we are given the illusion of choice as we make our left and right turns at the radio junctions. And what's extra interesting is that this early version also uses some radio messages that are different from the ones heard in the final game. Here the radio messages mention the murder of a wife and her two kids by the father of the family, even going into details how he lured the daughter and son to do so, it's quite unsettling. I'll shut up now and let you listen to these cut messages in full. As the congressional debate over gun control flares up yet again, we regret to report the murder of a wife and her two children by their husband and father. The father purchased the rifle used in the crime at his local gun store two days earlier. This brutal killing took place while the family was gathered at home on a Sunday afternoon. Called 9-11, found the father in his car listening to the radio. Several days before the murders, Nick looked behind you. I said, look behind you. Like he was chanting some strange spell. You've been chosen. Son came to investigate the commotion. The father shot him too. Don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started. His six-year-old daughter had the good sense to hide in the bathroom, but reports suggest he lured her out by telling her it was just a game. The girl was found shot once in the chest from point-blank range. And if these sounded familiar, they should, as to add to the obvious inspiration of this area from the 2014 demo of the cancelled game PT, these radio messages were straight up borrowed out of that game as placeholders here. Moving through the halls, we can also see a goofy early animation of Catnap looking at us and then scurrying away. In one of the halls here, we can also see an early version of the scratch mark messages saying the path ahead seems dim. And then another crazy thing in this early map that you might have already noticed is that the picture near some of the radios isn't of some orphaned kids, but it's of some scientists. And not just any scientists, these are actually the scientists from the Black Mesa Research Facility from Half-Life, and this is actually a texture from the game Half-Life 2. I just thought this was a really cool little placeholder to have chosen to be used here. 
Anyways, just like in the final version of this area, eventually you start to hear a phone ringing, and following the sound will lead you to an untextured room here with a model of a grab pack hand on a phone, and interacting with it will result in not Ollie chatting with you, but instead a really creepy voice telling you to run. And honestly, this one I think is a hundred times scarier. You need to run. The resulting little peek in by Catnap is much less scary though as he just awkwardly moves away again. After this, we get the last radio message that instructed the player to look behind them, and if the player does so here, they will see that the path they took to get to this radio has been sealed off. This doesn't end up happening in the final version of this area, though I think this would have made for a really cool effect there. Then if we disable lighting, we can see a goofy model of Catnap staring at us through this door. The next radio message here has some absolutely jammin' music that I don't think goes used anywhere else in the game. And then there's another creepy hallway where we can just see Catnap's eyes, but if we disable the lighting again, it becomes way more goofy than creepy. Eventually though, we get to the final room, which here is eerily referred to as the Smile Room, where as we approach, we get to hear the unsettling sound of children crying. And once inside, we can, go figure, see an early version of the room with placeholder models of basically everything there, including the TV from which Hallucination Huggy spawns from in the final version. And here we actually get the only early version of using a VCR, as we can actually grab the placeholder VHS tape here and slap it into the VCR, and yeah, this actually causes the original Huggy image texture to show up on the TV. Unfortunately, the tape doesn't go away and just remains in our hand, but I just thought it was super cool to see the image here used like this. And this all but confirms that this image was indeed used as the basis for the Hallucination Huggy image that ended up being made for the final version of this area. So cool. And lastly for this area, if we take the camera out of bounds, just like in the final version, we can see the illusion of choice this map gives us, as no matter what path you take, you always end up going to the same destination. But what's extra interesting is that there's also a chunk of hallways disconnected from the rest way out here. There's nothing too exciting about these though, it just seems like each of the three main sections here uses a different texture for the walls, so perhaps this was a way to test how they would look and how they could transition between the different textures or something. Oh, and yeah, there's yet another model of this goof just chilling at the end here as well. And then for the final unused early map, or at least for the ones that are more so complete, we have an early version of the final boss battle area listed as Final Encounter Blockout. And you know the drill by now, it's basically an early version with more basic placeholder models. We got some early sockets for the batteries, an early model for not only the green power node source, but some really basic looking models for the charge points that you need to bring the charge to in order to activate the even more basic looking pipes that blow out the steam. We can also see that this rusty platform here was used as a placeholder for the sliding door. And then lastly for this area, something that actually ended up getting cut from the final version is this large see-through pipe that leads to an also unused ammo box. Now I will talk about this more in a future video, but basically, originally, the orange hand that you find in the game that lets you launch flares was planned to take ammo that you would find throughout the chapter instead of just auto-reloading on a timer. So I guess this shoot here would have likely been a way to infinitely get ammo during the boss fight against Catnap, suggesting that there were plans to incorporate the orange hand into the final fight so that all three special grab pack hands would be utilized instead of just the green and purple ones. I guess juggling all three hands might have been deemed too much to deal with, but I don't know. I wish the orange hand got a bit more use in this chapter, it just seemed to end up being a way to generate light in darker areas towards the end. And now, last up for this video is an unused map simply titled Dev Notes, and as the name suggests, this spawns us into a room with a whole bunch of dev text all over the place. Now, I'm assuming this was supposed to be loaded in alongside an early map so a dev could, well, see where all of these notes were for, but unfortunately, whatever map that may have been is no longer left over in the files. That said though, we can still kinda piece together where and what these were for. 
Phone Call 2 is the one that you get from Ollie when you first enter Playcare, so this was shortly after the cable car ride. There are more notes for phone calls when plugging in the home sweet home cord and grabbing the gas production zone key, so this was under the statue, and more. There's also this general note here in the middle for how the devs implemented some of the catnap interactions. And then looking around, we can also see some dev messages for the different buildings in Playcare. For starters, in the Home Sweet Home section, we can see a placeholder location for the tape there, as well as references to Kissy Missy's room as well as Ollie's room. Now I'm not sure if the room we see Kissy Missy there was meant to be her room, but I don't think I recall ever seeing a room that was explicitly supposed to be Ollie's room there. Then, not far from here, we can see another tape, a placeholder for where you find the gas mask, and then various notes for radio messages, and this must have been for the hallucination sequence there. Then for the school area, we can see a placeholder for one of the teacher diary messages, the door that ends up crushing Miss Delight, and later a very early layout for the power puzzle where you have to bounce up with the purple hand. Which, based on this, seems like it was originally planned to appear near the schoolhouse instead of the counselor's office as it's seen in the final. We then get to the cave area between the school and the playhouse, and here we can see probably the most interesting thing of this map. Not only is it a placeholder for the prototype shrine that's seen there in the final game, but here we can also see that it was planned to be placed here only if the toy store remained cut from the game. And since it did end up being placed here, yeah, that basically confirms that the toy store was planned to be another area the player would go through, but the decision was eventually made to scrap it. From here, we can get to the playhouse entrance, but surprisingly, there's not really anything else here for the playhouse, so next we go to the counselor's office building. Here we start near the tape that plays the emergency alert on several TVs throughout the hallway, and we can see quite a few placeholders for those here. We then get to a placeholder message for the cutscene in the game where we can see a Bunzo Bunny doll get absolutely trucked by Catnap. And then we can get to the building's generator, which ends up being the last one that the player needs to connect in this chapter. Then close by, there's another dev note, and this is actually another placeholder spot for the prototype shrine, only this time, this is the spot that it would have been had the toy store area not been cut. And yup, you might have guessed it, since this is just to the right of the counselor's office from the middle, it appears that originally the plan was for the player to discover the prototype shrine in the Toy Store area. It was pretty cool to see it in the caves, but I think seeing a massive shrine in a creepy rundown toy store would have been super creepy too. And lastly for this area, we have the gas production zone, and here we got placeholder text for the red sludge from the gas machines that falling into would kill the player GG. There's a few more spots for where the phone calls from Ollie would start, and then interestingly there's also the Claire Harper tape here, which in the final game is actually the first one the player can obtain just after the trash compactor room, so I guess the plan was originally for it to be found here. We then see notes for the gas cylinders, the double arrowed button on the main computer, the lab sign which we also saw in the early blockout map I mentioned earlier, placeholders for where you get the grab pack 2.0, as well as the big blue battery slot, which it looks like was originally going to be more so a big power outlet than another slot for a battery. And then lastly, near the note for the poppy closing scene, we can, once again, see in big beautiful text that indeed the plan was for a big prison sign to have been revealed here. I'm definitely curious to see if they outright decided to change where the next chapter will take place, or if they just wanted to keep it a mystery for a while longer, but I guess only time will tell. Alright, so for starters, since a bunch of you have been leaving comments about this on my first video, as I guess I'm a bit late to this party, let's chat about two unused secret areas found just out of bounds in the Playhouse map. So first, it turns out that just beyond this wall in this pool section is the entrance to a scrapped ride segment, where the plan was for the player to actually ride the duck boat things found around the area. And it turns out that it's actually functional too, as if you go up to this boat here and interact with it, you'll actually get sucked into it and you'll phase right through the first gate as it starts to move. 
This duck ride slowly takes you through the area, and you'll come up to a few of these closed gates where you have to pull on the lever nearby to slowly open them up. Well, at least the first one works, for some reason, by the time you get to the second gate here, basically, no matter where you aim, the grab pack hands will just, like, grab onto some invisible thing just above you, thus making getting through the rest of the ride normally impossible. Now, I've seen theories around the internet for this area, mostly either it being a scrapped segment for escaping Dog Day as you have to get through this ride while he chases you, or alternatively, this would have been another area where the mini smiling critters would chase you around and this would have been like a shooting gallery of sorts, where the player would have to constantly look around and keep blasting them with the flares while making sure to open up the gates in a timely manner. Whatever the case for this ride segment may have been though, eventually the ride would end up on this beach, where then, after going through this shipwreck, the player would end up getting to the prison section where you normally run into Dog Day, suggesting that this may have been the original way to get into that room, as maybe these doors here were originally planned to be locked or something. Strangely enough though, if I enable seeing triggers in the game, there's actually an arrow here pointing in the other direction in the shipwreck, and normally, these arrows are a good indicator of where the player is supposed to go, but based on the gate levers being on the other side of the walls here, I don't think this arrow here is correct, at least for how this ride ended up being developed. I think it's honestly pretty nuts that the developers kept this little ride here and just sealed off the entrance as well as the exit in the prison area with just some simple walls. Like, for 99% of players that play this game, they'd have absolutely no idea that just beyond these walls is a scrap section that's still somewhat functional. And then, the other normally unused room in this map is found just behind this red door that you come across in this room not long from the start of this playhouse area. Now, normally, of course, there's no way to open this door, but just beyond it, there's like a weird platforming-like section with these things that look like they should swing... And then in the next room are some more platforms, connected to some poles. And just judging on how these platforms are spaced apart, and the fact that you can easily jump between them, it's quite likely that there were at least some plans at some point for this to be an area that the player could enter. Unfortunately, even though we can get all the way up to the top, apart from this little vent section that doesn't seem to serve any purpose in the state, there's not really anything up at the top here. Now, to call both of these areas completely unused wouldn't be exactly accurate, as you can actually see them both while playing the game. Now granted, they're only visible during the Dog Day chase sequence, as you can see the ride area below you in one of the tunnels, and the other area above you here, so you'd be forgiven if you never really noticed that they were there since you were being chased in the darkness. But I suppose that's probably why the developers kept these rooms in the map instead of just outright deleting them. Though, I guess they also could have just covered up seeing them, like they did with the entrances and exits. Now next up, there's actually a secret lemon found out of bounds in the school area. Yeah, just behind this window here and then behind this prop is this little lemon fella. Now why is he so fascinated about an out of bounds lemon, you might be wondering. Well, this lemon is actually, I guess, a sort of running gag by the developers of this game. Now, I haven't talked about this in a video yet, but added back to the game in an update to the first chapter back in 2023 was this lemon that could be found on one of the catwalks in the ending section of the chapter before you enter the poppy room. And this lemon actually talks. Limon? 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 Now the lemon lore gets even deeper though, as there's also a secret death screen for chapter 1, which you can get after spamming the f*** out of interacting with the lemon, which will result in another sound effects titled Limon Death to play. Limon, 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 limon. Limon. And then after, the death screen will just read, Limon, Limon. And yeah, this Limon also returns here in Chapter 3 as I guess a little secret for those snooping around in areas that they aren't normally supposed to go. Limon. 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 It's a pretty cool little Easter egg, or Easter lemon, I guess. I hope they keep hiding these in future chapters. And while we're chatting about the school, apparently, originally Miss Delight was going to function quite differently to how she's seen in the final cut of the game. 
So normally, she basically works like the Endos from FNAF Security Breach, where as long as you're looking at her, she'll freeze up, and will only chase you around when you break line of sight. But, as was discussed in a stream of the game on Pastra's channel, apparently originally Miss Delight would only move around while the lights would flicker and shut off, in a sort of red light, green light way. Uh, when this chapter was in its early access stages, her mechanic was originally that she would move every single time the lights would flicker in the building and turn off. Oh. However, playtesters complained that it was incredibly unbalanced, so they changed her to be a weeping angel. So if you are ever wondering why the lights kind of flicker on and off, seemingly in a sort of repetitive, almost rhythmic nature, that's why. It's actually a remnant from this old mechanic. Now next up, let's go over some unused animations that were shown off by one of the game's developers, Achebe, over on X in an animation reel that he posted showcasing several things that he worked on for this game. And among the animations that are seen in the game are several that went unused, including a more elegant walk cycle for Miss Delight, which is quite the contrast compared to her usual waddle. And honestly, I can't decide which one of these is more creepy. Oh, and also in this reel, we can see a short clip that appears to show the original Miss Delight mechanic we just went over, as we can see her moving despite the player looking right at her. Anyways, next, there are also unused animations for the mini version of Bobby Bearhug preparing to jump, jumping, as well as falling. And then lastly, there's an unused animation of Catnap's bony hand trying to, I guess, grab at the player through a window, as well as what looks to be an unused jump scare animation also for Catnap. Now it's not 100% clear where exactly this window animation was intended to be used, but just based on it being the creepy bony catnap's hand here, it's likely that this was for somewhere around the ending boss fight segment. And now, last up for this video, let's go over several bits of audio that go unused in this chapter. So I went over the early, otherwise unused radio messages found in the early version of the Home Sweet Home hallucination segment in my previous video, but there are actually a few more otherwise unheard audio files that were used there as placeholders. These include placeholder sound effects for knocking on the doors there, the very creepy baby screams heard as you approach the smile room at the end of the segment there, there's a pretty creepy sound effect of some heavy breathing, And then, oddly, there's also an unused sound effect for a huggy robot jump scare. And it seems like this is the same sound effect from the jump scare for Robo Huggy from Project Playtime, so the file name checks out. In any case, I can only assume that this placeholder sound effect was probably meant for an early jump scare that would result from the hallucination huggy coming from the TV here. But aside from getting the image to pop up on the TV, nothing else really seemed to happen, so I haven't been able to actually find a way to activate this sound effect in game here. And then, unrelated from that stage, next are two early sound effects for the flares shot out by the orange hand. One for firing them, as well as one for them burning up. Next, there's also placeholder background music for the intro tunnel segment, and this is actually heard in the early version of that map that I went over in my previous video. It honestly sounds pretty unsettling. Let's have a quick listen.
Also, like I mentioned in the last video, now I found the file for the sound effect used for the press things clapping out of bounds listed as press boom. And then we also got some more temporary sound effects, including one for scratching glass, Breaking glass, something powering up, and powering down, an unlocking sound, an early phone ringing sound effect, there's a grinding sound effect for some machinery, a metallic echo, a comical sounding slide squeak akin to something used for someone slipping on a banana peel or something. I definitely want to know where that one was meant to be used. And then lastly, there are two temporary sound effects for, I guess, catnap. One for a meow. And then one for him purring, which honestly just sounds like purrs of a real cat. Now we never really see a nice side of catnap in the game where he'd meow or purr like this, so I guess it makes sense why these weren't reworked into the final cut. And now lastly, what I think are easily the most interesting bits of unused audio in this chapter are a pair of early phone call messages that reveal a completely different character that was scrapped from the game and replaced by Ollie. And also, the first of these messages starts out with what sounds like the sound of someone tuning a radio, so maybe the idea was originally that the player would communicate with this unseen character somehow differently, but anyways, the first voice clip seems to be the initial interaction that this character would make with the player. I'm glad to see you still kicking. See that door to the left? Should be a lever hidden right beside. And yeah, I guess that this was the one to be used in this room here, and it's kind of hard to understand the ending of that message, but I think he said there should be a lever hidden right beside. Should be a lever hidden right beside. And if that's the case, I guess there initially would have been a lever to open this door instead of requiring the battery that Ollie sends you in the final version. And then, the second of the two early phone messages seems to be for right after opening this door, as the voice mentions a mess that the player made, and I assume that this mess was the train crash. Oh, and also in this message, this scrapped character actually reveals his name to be Ace. Quite a mess you made here. How'd you manage that? Doesn't matter. If you need a name for me, we'll go with Ace. I'm making this call on Poppy's behalf. You probably don't want to talk to her right now, I get it. But trust me, she's keeping you here for a reason. Now, there's an escape and play care, but you gotta help me first. And the first favor you could do for me? Stay alive. Stay away from the playhouse. I'll call you. So there you have it. Before Ollie was Gregory 2.0, the more grisly Ace would have been your contact here instead. It's extra interesting too, since typically as we've seen on the series, although early lines like this are just recorded by someone as a placeholder, they typically are for the same character that's seen in the final version. But this one reveals a pretty big change to the story that appears to have been made, as I assume we'll see more of Ollie in future chapters of this game. Alright, so let's kick this video off by taking a look at some concept art and animations that were made for this game that give us a glimpse into some early ideas which were either altered or just didn't make it into the final cut. So first off, we have a few concept sketches made up by Sunny Lee, who was the environment concept artist for this chapter. First, we have a pair of concept sketches for the main play care concourse area in both a lit up daytime version as well as one with the lights off. 
Now this concept sketch looks more or less the same as how the area is seen in the final release, except for here we can see the toy store in its original cleaner state. In my first Lost Bits video on this chapter, we went over how there were originally once plans for the player to go through this toy store area in this chapter, but this was ultimately scrapped and the devs threw a bunch of trash in the way blocking the front door, and made the building a lot more run down. So yeah, it looks like this sketch of the area was still using the original cleaner version of that building that we also saw in the early version of the Playcare Dome. Then secondly, there's this part of the sketch that shows a painting of the area that someone here was working on. Truly some concept sketchception here. What's extra interesting about this painting though is that there appears to be a big red circle just around the left side of the toy store. Now it's unclear what this red circle is indicating here, but perhaps this was meant to be a hint in the area for something there. Then next up we have some concept art for Kissy Missy's room in the home sweet home area. Now right off the bat, you'll notice that the furniture and decor here looks infinitely better than the stuff seen in Home Sweet Home in the game. And we can see some bunk beds and desks that the kids of the orphanage would use in their room, and they'd even have their own TV and VCR. And of course, we can see Kissy Missy just chilling here, and I guess this scene was what would eventually become this part of the game where you can see her in the room here. And in addition to seeing a Blossom toy here from the Powerpuff Girls, another interesting thing to note is that the rug here only says Sweet Home and not Home Sweet Home. So maybe not having the first home in the title was originally planned for the name of the area. And then lastly from Sunny are actually a bunch of concept sketches for Catnap. The first set of these sketches are for the final part of the game where Catnap combusts after you shock him with the green hand, as we can see him catch fire a bit, fully catch fire, and then we can see his charred remains. And although this is pretty much what does happen in the game, the first of these sketches appears to reveal an idea where the player would actually be able to see Catnap's bones under his skin, as his fur and flesh would burn off. That would be quite graphic and unsettling, and since the series, according to the head of Mob Entertainment, is suitable for kids 8 and up and this series isn't gruesome or gory, I guess it makes sense that this was changed? And if you thought that was creepy, you ain't seen nothing yet, as the next sketch for Catnap reveals an early concept in which the Nightmare Catnap would actually be made up of the bodies of several humans, as we can see them throughout his body all the way down through his tail. Now these would presumably have been the victims of the Hour of Joy incident that took place at Playtime Co, as we can see people of all ages here, so probably both employees as well as orphans that were in the facility. Nightmare Catnap is scary enough as he's seen in the final game, but had they kept this original design, he'd probably be one of the scariest mascot indie horror characters out there. Then on a bit of a lighter note, while we're talking about Catnap, there's also another set of sketches made by Micah from Zamination, who used to work on this series that not only reveals the first ever concept sketches and ideas for the character, but also an early name too, Cuddle Kitty. We went over another early name for the character, Nappy Cat, in my first video, and honestly, between Catnap, Cuddle Kitty, and Nappy Cat, I definitely think Catnap rolls off the tongue the best. This document also reveals that the original idea for the character was much different, as Catnap would also double as a suit that a person could wear. And then I guess the idea would be that the player would be able to see the skeletal remains of a human that once wore the suit, kinda sorta like FNAF's Springtrap I suppose. And even though the final decision for Catnap's design took a different path, I guess remnants of this idea did go on to be used in the final design, as the zipper on Catnap's belly here is where, in the original idea, a person would enter the suit. Next, in an animation reel posted by the game's technical artist, James Pelter, not only do we get a cool behind-the-scenes look at how the models were rigged up for animation, we also get to see glimpses at some unused stuff too. So first, I mentioned how there was an unused clean model of Mistalite found just above the school area in the game, but this video shows that there was work done on rigging her up too, suggesting that the clean version was indeed once planned to have a bigger role in the game. The ruined version of Miss Delight is certainly creepy, but this clean one is honestly just as, if not creepier in my opinion, with that absolutely terrifying grin. 
Now, some of you have left comments on my first video saying that this model is used in the Hour of Joy tape, and although that might be likely, there, the Mistalites are only seen stiff for only a few frames of the video. So regardless, with just how rigged up this clean model was, there were likely bigger plans for this version. Then, the end of this reel also reveals an unused concept for how the player's grab pack hands would switch. Instead of the right hand just moving down and switching out of view, this concept would have had a mechanism actually come up, grab the currently equipped hand, pull it off, and then retrieve another one from below. This honestly looks pretty cool, and I think this would have been more interesting to see in the game than how the switching ended up being finalized. And now lastly for the concept, as a little aside, let's once again talk about the creepy huggy image that was left over unused in chapter 1 of this game, and then now reworked into the hallucination huggy VHS section of chapter 3. So I've brought up this image a lot throughout many videos I've made on Poppy Playtime, but now we finally have more information about how and why it was made. So according to Andy, who also used to work with Mob Entertainment until recently moving over to my friends over at Glitch Productions, the Huggy image was created while they were rigging up the model for Huggy Wuggy for the first chapter, after they deformed the mesh and reduced the gamma. I think it's kind of funny that one of the most iconic unused graphics of this whole game was just the result of some messing around. And now, for the second half of this video, let's go over some of the more notable textures and models that are left over unused in the files of Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 here. For starters, there are actually quite a few textures seemingly left over from the Project Playtime multiplayer spin-off game. There's a bunch of stuff from several screensaver graphics featuring Mommy Longlegs, some survivors, as well as basically the entire Playtime Company catalog of toys. There's graphics for the game's Premium Battle Pass, as well as a similar looking one for a Toy Box Bundle. There's a UI graphic for a 2x Battle Pass XP progress bar. Several UI graphics for the head toy parts used in Project Playtime, including those for Cat B, Candy Cat, Boogie Bot, as well as Brawn. And then finally, two textures for the thumbnail graphics of the Boxy Boo and Huggy Wuggy cosmetic mask items from that game. Now I didn't mention this in my previous videos, but what's extra interesting about the Huggy Wuggy mask texture here is that it's actually found hidden out of bounds here in one of the early versions of the gas production zone all the way down here. Why this fella's here isn't clear. Same with why all of the other Project Playtime graphics are left over. It's just extra weird that this thumbnail mask texture was slapped in here out of bounds. Then, sort of similar to these unused mask textures, next we have this unused texture of a clown face. Now, I don't think I recall seeing any sort of clowns in Chapter 3 here, but I guess this creepy clown could have been a placeholder meant for maybe the playhouse because it kinda sorta looks like a carnival tent? I don't know. If you have any other theories, let us know down in the comments. Anyways, next up are six unused placeholder hint textures that were meant for the school area, seemingly one for six different school subjects. Art, math, science, reading, spelling, and uh, science again, as this references a train? And yeah, these appear to also reveal a scrapped idea where there were going to seemingly be six different puzzles throughout the school that the player would have to solve to, I guess, progress through it, with many of them seemingly offering the player a choice to go either left or right. The art one would seemingly have the player mixing up colors to solve the puzzle, and I don't know if it's a coincidence, but these just so happen to be the three colors of the right grab pack hands that you use in this chapter. The math one seems to have had the player solve some sort of code. This one's much more philosophical with a spin on the age-old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. And then the other ones are a bit more vague, like I have no idea what the planet or blue and red squares puzzle could have been. And although this planet puzzle was never implemented, there are several models left over in the files that appear to perhaps be remnants of it. Now, I did end up seeing that some of these are used in a room in the counselor's office building, but since these are found among the files for the school stuff, I'm still pretty confident that these are a remnant from that originally planned planetary puzzle. Now, personally, I do wish there had been some more puzzles like this in this chapter instead of just the power puzzles or battery ones, 
but I guess these may have been deemed to have slowed down the pace of the gameplay a bit too much or something, so the decision was made to scrap these in favor of keeping the school area more in line with just some more battery puzzles before the final encounter with Miss Delight there. Next up, there is an unused graphic of what appears to either be an in-game screenshot or a settings menu mockup listed simply as Image. And although it may just look like a boring old settings menu, this actually appears to reveal an option that was scrapped for the final cut of the game, and that's to change the version of DirectX, and in-game coding reveals that it could be changed between DirectX 11 and 12. And then lastly for the unused textures, there are actually three meant for an equally scrapped usable item known simply as a Viewmaster. And these are images of three areas found in St. Louis, Missouri, where Mob Entertainment is actually headquartered. We got the St. Louis Gateway Arch, Bush Stadium where the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team plays, and finally the Missouri Botanical Garden. Now these all appear to just be placeholder textures for slides to be used with the Viewmaster, and although the exact use of this item isn't 100% known, based on some coding that's also left over for it in the game, it's likely that this item would have worked like this Viewmaster toy. Now for those of you that never had these growing up, basically you slap in a paper disc with some tiny images on it and you could look through it to then see them magnified and pull a little lever on the side to move on to the next slide. Yeah, before smartphones, this was basically how kids could easily and portably look at images of nature or animals or whatever that wasn't in a textbook or something. Anyways, even though remnants of this item can still be loaded into the game where we can see what appears to be a placeholder model of it in the items menu where it just looks like a simple hollowed out octagon, it's still not usable or anything, so it's unclear whether this was planned to actually have had any meaningful gameplay uses, or if it was just an item where the player could simply look at images of various areas in Playtime Company or something, as a leftover description for it is just crazy description. This unused Viewmaster definitely has my curiosity peaked. Hopefully one day we can get some more information about it. And on that note, let's now talk about a few more items that are left over unused in this chapter. First up, I brought up the unused toy area before, but to add to it, there's actually a key meant for it also left over in the game, simply known as Toy Key. So, it looks like, similar to several of the other areas in this chapter, Bali was also once planned to have tossed you a key to enter the toy store as well. And then, I teased this in my first video, but left over in the game are also unused items related to the Orange Flare Shooting Hand, an ammo crate, small ammo, and although there's no leftover model for it, a small ammo box too. Now all of these appear to reveal early plans for the Flare Gun Hand not to have unlimited ammo where you just have to wait around for it to reload, but rather that you'd have to find either these single 12 gauge small flare shells around the map, or a larger amount of them in these ammo crates, which as I discussed in my first video on this chapter, there's one of these still found left over in the early version of the final catnap boss fight map, where it would seemingly constantly get refilled by this pipe. Now just based on how much you need the flares at the start of the playhouse area to fend off the smiling critter toys, and how later it's mostly just used as an optional light source or to detect fake catnaps in the final fight, I think it does make more sense for the player to just have an unlimited supply on a cooldown timer. And I brought up the Huggy Wuggy mask texture earlier, but one of these flare rounds can also be found just chilling here out of bounds above the early version of the final boss fight area too. Furthermore, the texture on this unused ammo crate also gives us a bit more info on the nature of these flares. The 40 here looks like it refers to the count per box, and then the rest of this appears to mean that despite looking like 12 gauge shells, these were meant to actually be 50 caliber linked armor piercing incendiary rounds. Now the flares in this chapter certainly don't seem to be armor piercing, and it looks like the devs likely just made the texture for this based off some real military ammo boxes, but it's interesting to think that on top of making toys and hosting an orphanage, Playtime Co. might also have ammunition manufacturing on their resume. Now next up, I've went over the toy store that was cut from this chapter a lot in these videos, but it turns out that there are quite a few models that were meant to be used there that are still left over in the game's files. Found in a folder in the files titled Play Store, there are numerous models here. 
Now, I do believe most of these are used in the game, like some of these busted up toys and boxes, this cash register that's seen in the main play care area here, as well as the fun bucks builds, which can be seen scattered around the cash register, as well as right in front of the toy store, only reinforcing that these would be used there too. Then, initially, I also thought that some of these shelves and bins and such, as well as these coins, were also unused. But I did actually find them in this area near the cable car entrance, so it looks like these did go on to be used despite the Play Store being cut. And to add to that, some other stuff like these larger stacks of bills, this curved shelving unit, as well as these rolls of coins, I believe are only ever seen in the office room of Eduardo Gala, the head of the toy store. So, just the fact that these can basically only be found in this one room, I think, only solidifies that they would have been seen more frequently in the toy store as well. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I've seen this cool looking flashlight anywhere in this chapter that's also found in this Play Store folder here. And based on its file name, this flashlight would have apparently been found in some sort of first aid kit. Overall though, I'm still pretty disappointed that the inside of the toy store was scrapped. With that being the originally planned area where we'd see the shrine to the prototype and all, I think this would have made for an awesome part of this chapter. And now, last up for this video, there are also numerous early placeholder models left over in the game. Now, many of these were made up for the early versions of the maps I covered in my previous video, but in any case, we got the unused Nintendo 64 controller that was found out of bounds in the early tunnels map, some balcony doors, another door, an early battery, a microwave oven, a medical jar, a very basic model of a phone, an equally basic security camera, a TV, a trampoline, a placeholder pair of pistons, some tanks, an early model of the green hand charge receivers that we also saw in the early version of the final boss fight area, early parts of the entrance to the play care cable car including the turnstile arches and trees, these candy carts seen up here, and then an early model for the cable car itself. There's an early model of the VHS tapes, and then there's also a bunch of frankly less interesting stuff like a chair, book, bed, vent covers, and more. It should be no surprise to anyone that these don't normally get seen by the player in this chapter, but regardless, it's pretty cool that we still have these kicking around in the files. Alright, so to start, let's go over what we found unused in Chapter 2 and what did and didn't make its way into Project Playtime here. So for starters, six months before Project Playtime's release, it was believed that the scrapped multiplayer mode, at the time, was going to play similarly to Dead by Daylight, and yeah, it certainly does play like Dead by Daylight now, so score one for us. Then next, found in the files, we had Monster Selector, basically a box in which Huggy Wuggy and Mommy Longlegs were found, and as the file name suggests, it was likely going to be where a character select screen was tested for these monsters. Now, although this was definitely updated for Project Playtime's release, as each monster is seen in this jail cell-like room instead, a similar box to this one as seen in Chapter 2 is still found in one of the early test maps found here in Project Playtime, but we'll come back to that later in this video. So, for all intents and purposes, yes, this technically did make its way into Project Playtime, but it did get replaced with an updated version. Next in my video, we looked over all five of the different Playtime Co. player models that were going to be used as the hero or survivors for the mode. Now, although these characters are basically the ones that are used in Project Playtime, their models definitely got an upgrade, and five different colors was cool and all, but microtransactions. So now you can choose from a plethora of colors, hats, hands, pants, you name it, to really customize your character. At this point in current year gaming, I don't think the existence of cosmetics and a battle pass system should really shock anyone. Also, based on the color range of the survivors, it seems like only five survivor characters were considered initially, but in Project Playtime you can have up to six heroes going against the monster, so that's pretty cool. Then next in my video, we took a look at two planned moves for Huggy Wuggy, Charge Hug as well as Trap Breaker. 
Although no longer mentioned by name in Project Playtime, Huggy Wuggy's shift move does still appear to be a charge hug, so check on that one, but his E move is no longer a trap breaker, but rather the ability to place in mini huggies that can alert you to a player within their range. Then next up for Mommy Longlegs, who is absolutely broken in Project Playtime by the way, we saw two moves, Spotter as well as Spiderweb, which still had a placeholder black ball projectile left over in Chapter 2. And unlike with Huggy, both of these moves actually did make their way into Project Playtime, as you can shoot out spiderwebs to slow down any players in sight, and then a Spotter ability is also in Mommy's arsenal, as you can use it to detect players through walls for a brief time. And now, I think everyone's favorite part from my original Chapter 2 video, the hand gesture emotes. Now initially, it looked like they were going to be mapped to certain key inputs such as pressing a few of the number keys in a game, but this has been changed to pressing X by default to open up a wheel of emotes that you can customize instead. Left over in Chapter 2, there were four hand gestures that we went over, and three of them made their way into the game here, at least currently. And if you've watched that video, you probably know which one didn't make it. So the thumbs up made it, as did the thumbs down, as well as the okay hand gesture, but unfortunately the beloved flipping the bird emote didn't have the same luck. This definitely seemed like a fan favorite in the comments when I released my original video, and who knows, we're only in Season 1 of Project Playtime as I make this video, and I'm sure they'll be adding more and more hand gestures to the game in future updates, so maybe one day we'll see this again. Then next, just like the player models, their animations, although similar to what we saw unused in Chapter 2, are updated here as well, and then there's the blue hand scanner and win cube. Although a blue hand scanner is seen on the generators in regular gameplay, the wind cube I don't think is seen at all. But a similar red cube frame is seen in an unused map left over in Project Playtime, which again we'll come back to later in this video. And lastly, we also mentioned a few screens left over in Chapter 2 for Mommy Longlegs winning a game, Huggy Wuggy getting the player, as well as a reward screen where the player was given 150 points. The screens for getting got are fairly similar, though the main text font was changed, which is good because now it actually looks like it says Mommy Longlegs and not Mommy Yongyegs, but the subtext was actually changed from just waiting for another player to revive the downed one to instead displaying the auto-revival text and meter. And then, as far as the reward screen goes, yeah, it got overhauled by quite a bit and looks much better. And of course, points, as referred to here, were changed to tickets, which in Project Playtime you can use for stuff like buying sabotage or upgrades for the monsters and survivors. And that's just about all we saw left over in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2, and by the looks of it, almost all of the things that were left over there did make their way into the final version of Project Playtime, at least in one way or another. So yeah, super cool that we were able to find a glimpse into what would come over half a year into the future back then. And now, moving on to talking about the rest of Project Playtime, let's first take the camera around and talk about some things left normally unseen out of bounds. Now, unfortunately, as far as the two regular playable maps that are currently in the game go, there isn't really much of note found outside of the game's regular bounds, but thankfully, there are a few things for us to find in the two tutorial levels that the game makes you play the first time that you start it. Firstly, for the hero or survivor tutorial, just behind one of the doors that are normally blocked, there's this empty hallway in the void, and here we can find some floating developer text left over here. This is the same kind of text that we've recently seen in both FNAF Security Breach as well as Poppy Playtime Chapter 2, and they seem to be little notes left in by the developers for QA testers or context or notes to indicate something that should be added to the area in the future. Anyways, for this instance, we get a nice little message just welcoming us to the tutorial. Then next, there's this white platform found off in the distance with a lone survivor just chilling on it. Now at first I thought maybe this was the survivors that you meet in the Wacka Wuggy area later in the tutorial, but nope, they're already there as soon as the map loads. And it turns out that this is actually Bill, the survivor that's sent to save you after you get sent down to the Wuggy area yourself, as after he comes in there's no longer a survivor found on that platform. This tutorial section also has a bunch of miscellaneous stuff found above the map, including parts of the toy pillar puzzles, as well as some double door handle things which I don't think are seen in this tutorial at all. 
And also similarly, there's this red box which too has a handle on it. This again isn't something seen in this tutorial either, but I reckon this might have been for a tutorial section in which the game would teach you to pull objects onto something, as this is a mechanic that's seen in a later test map that we'll go over in this video. And then lastly for the survivor tutorial, not really unused, but interestingly the Wackawuggy pit is found beneath the map and it looks like you actually drop in when captured and are pulled out when rescued. In both the museum and factory maps playable in the game, the Wuggy Pits are actually found above the maps. And the game actually cleverly tricks you into thinking that you're being pulled up when actually you get warped back down into the map instead. Now next we move on to the monster side of the tutorial, where here there's not nearly as much stuff found out of bounds, but we do have three more hidden developer messages. All three of these messages give explicit context into the prerequisites for opening certain gates in the tutorial, apparently known as LP gates. The first door here only opens after the player punches and jumps, LP gate 2 opens after a mini Wuggy sentry is placed down, and finally LP gate 3 won't open until the player uses the shutdown sabotage move. These objectives are pretty obvious when playing the tutorial as the text is slapped right on screen, but still pretty cool to see these messages hidden out of view. And now, last up for this video, there are a handful of unused maps left over in Project Playtime here, and these include extremely early versions of both the theater and factory map, a currently unused map that will probably get added in a future update, as well as a dev test map where of course various aspects of the game were tested. So first up we have Dev Map 7, and this looks to be an incredibly early version of the theater map. As you can see, almost all of the textures are missing, the geometry is super simplified, and more. Now I won't be going into every little change between this early version and the one seen in the current build, as that would probably take a few hours, but I will definitely go over several highlights. Well, for starters, here, in addition to this slightly differently colored Huggy Wuggy statue being found out of bounds and this large cylinder thing, we can also find the old monster select box that I mentioned earlier. The box itself appears to be the same one as we saw in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2, but here Boxyboo was of course added, Mommy Longlegs is still T-posing, and Huggy Wuggy has had his size changed to better match the rest of the monsters, and definitely isn't as happy as he was before. So yeah, I suppose whenever this early theater map was being developed, this was still the placeholder section that was used for the character select screen. Now moving inbounds into the theater, several notable changes can be seen. Here at the start, we can see some really high resolution, photorealistic looking grass texturing this cube, well at least most of it, and then this same grass can also be seen at the base of the golden huggy statue at the front area of the theater. This grass texture and these blocks aren't ever normally seen in any of the final maps in the game. Then also at the front here we have this interesting water feature that's shaped like an upside down cone. I guess this was an early placeholder for the poppy fountain that's seen here in the final. Honestly though, I really dig this effect. Then next as we move on we can see a much earlier ticket booth. The concession area to the left of it appears to have a different layout, and the bronze statue I believe is in a different spot. And then taking the stairs up to the theater on either side of the ticket booth we can see a theater sign which I believe is just the same one that was used in Poppy Playtime Chapter 1, and these signs were removed completely from this map in the final version. Then inside the theater we can see that the whole feel of it is completely different than how it's seen in the final. Not only are the theater chairs just placeholder office chairs here, but everything just seems more jolly, as it looks like they were initially going for a more juvenile feel to the theater, similar to something like the daycare theater and area in FNAF Security Breach. And yeah, this is way different than the fancy, elaborate, almost regal feel of the final theater map. And to add to this, the stage was changed quite a bit too. Instead of the large flaming huggy wuggy cutout thing on the stage with a curtain backdrop, here we have a nice cheery and cloudy background as well as this extremely creepy huggy wuggy here by these blocks. Just something about his eyes and smile here I think makes him look even more creepy than the normal version of huggy. Then probably my favorite difference in the entire theater here is with the projection room. 
On top of the area just being much more simplified here, the devs literally just enlarged one of the security cameras here to be a placeholder for the projector and just called it a day. It looks incredibly goofy and I love it. Eventually, of course, the projector did end up getting a proper model. Then in the middle, in front of the stage, there's also... whatever you want to call this. It's like some weirdly shaped polygonal object, and then for whatever reason, there's also a train cart just sitting in the middle of it. Yeah, I have no clue what this is or why it's here. I guess it might have just been a placeholder object for this bunch of chairs that were put here in the final version. Next up, under the entrance area, there are also a few really basic objects here that look like some early doors and such. There's not really too much else to say about most of the rest of this area. It's mostly untextured, hella simplified, rooms aren't quite what they were made into later, the stacks of chairs and tables and whatnot are missing, but the worst part is, no popcorn machine and no way to get some yummy stuff. Now one last thing I want to mention are the hatches that the monster normally has to take a downed player to in order to send them down to the Wuggy Pit. So at the point of development when this map was made, I guess this pit wasn't made yet at all, as each of these hatches just leads to a small little room where I guess the players would just get stuck in during testing. It's weird, it's so basic, but I almost find it kind of charming. Now there are actually two more maps related to the theater, MP Map 7 as well as Dev Theater Temp. Now I say maps in quotations as both of these are really lacking and certainly aren't as playable as the other one. MP Map 7 introduces some texturing as we can see the concession area looks much better, but that's about where the improvements end as the rest of the map is just the front stairs, some beams for the underground maintenance section, as well as a whole bunch of textureless stuff in the back here. Then secondly, easily even less interesting, Dev Theater Temp is literally just a bunch of textureless planes that can only be seen from one direction. Yup, that's it. Super exciting, I know. Now moving on, next up we have an early version for the only other map currently playable in the game, the Factory, here listed as MP Map 1. Much like the early theater map, although the layout is generally the same as is seen in the final version and things are where they should be, well, mostly, some things are definitely unfinished. Of course, there's a large lack of texturing once again, go figure, but also we have some early rails on the sides of the catwalks, some of the machinery is definitely unfinished, and we also got incredibly basic placeholders for whatever these things are in the final map, as well as this assembly line delivery system. There's also this room here, where some texturing was attempted, but basically everything in this room uses the same brown texture, so everything just looks really scuffed here. One more thing of note here is the severe lack of the hatch things we just discussed in the theater map. I think there's only like two, maybe three here, and unlike in the theater map, these hatches don't even have the little rooms under them at all. Being listed as Map 1, I guess this might have been the first map worked on, so perhaps at the time, the mechanic for throwing down captured survivors wasn't far enough along to have any system for them implemented here yet. And lastly for the stage, there are also a few objects found out of normal bounds. Just behind this wall by the train station here, there are a pair of lockers as well as a blank hand scanner thing. Now this one doesn't have the train logo or any handprints on it, but I reckon this was a placeholder for the scanner used in the game to call a train to the station. This stage certainly feels more empty compared to the theater as it just seems to lack more objects. But still, in both cases it was really cool to play around in these early maps. Not only do they give us an interesting look into earlier stages of the development process of Project Playtime, but I think it also helps us appreciate just how much they were improved. I saw that they're going to be adding a low level of detail skin for Huggy Wuggy in this game in the future, so I think it would be awesome to maybe add an early looking stage like this into the game too. Now those are the early versions of the maps that are currently in the game, but there's also actually one more unused map that's an early version of the stage that's almost certainly going to be the next one that's added to the game. So you might be wondering, we saw map 1 and map 7, what happened to the 5 maps in between? Well, I'm sure there were more maps made in between, but the only one that's actually left in the game is an early version of Map 5 here, and this appears to be a stage that will take place in a foundry of sorts. 
Now, we'll probably talk more about this in a future video, but left over in the game is this image, which appears to be a screenshot from this stage. And this is actually the same image as the one that's blurred behind the coming soon text on the stage select menu. So yeah, this is almost definitely going to be the next map coming to this game. This stage is honestly pretty similar in my opinion to the factory level, as we have a bunch of catwalks and machinery everywhere. The centerpiece of the stage is definitely the foundry section in the middle, so I guess buckets of some sort of hot melted metal would be brought in and then dumped into a central container which here also has a train car inside of it. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's with these train cars being placed in these random places. Anyways, this poured metal would then be seemingly processed into large rectangular sheets, and then, just like we talked about earlier, here we again see some more floating dev text giving us context into how the rest of this process is being planned to function. So here some machine would lift up the sheets of hot metal, then I guess they would make their way onto a conveyor line where this presser, that's here just seen as a placeholder white cube, would press them, and then this machine would process the pressed metal into rolls, and finally the rolls would make their way into this corner of the map, where they would be packaged and shipped. I'm assuming these overhead doors will lead to a more proper looking distribution area, but for now this back area is just a weird maze. The rest of this map isn't super interesting I find, at least in its current stage. But when we take the camera out though, things definitely get a bit spicier. For starters, although this map already has two train stations, behind this wall we can see what looks like a third planned or scrapped train station. And this is further reinforced as behind the next wall there is a sign for it too. For such a small map like this, two train stations feels like more than enough already, three would be absolutely nuts. Then, as far as out of bounds objects go, we have this line of pipes, this fan placed underneath a bunch of other ones, as well as one that's much bigger, and then, in addition to once again seeing the original Monster Select area, it appears that some more work was done on implementing the Wuggy Pit, as found in another box under the map, we can find a small room with some more dev text. This time saying, the Wuggies got you, press comma and period to spectate. Now although no proper Wuggy area is found here yet, I guess this is where testers would have been taken to after dying to them when testing this map. And lastly for the stuff found out of bounds, there's a whole bunch of miscellaneous puzzle pieces found way underneath the map. And some of them, like the piano keys here, are found at like weird angles, so not only is it weird that these are found so far under the map, but this makes it even more strange. Although I personally would have rather opted for a map not as similar to the factory we already have, I'm excited to see how Dev Map 5 here will evolve into how it's presented when fully released in the game. And now, last up for this video, we have a pair of developer test maps that are still found kicking around in the game, with one being quite robust. But first up, the less interesting one is known as Dev RGB Splat Map Testing. This isn't a very big map, but we have some cement structures, this piece of machinery that we saw picking up sheets in the foundry map, and then the main attraction of this map are these three tiles here. And it looks like this is where the splat mapping was tested as the name of the map suggests. Now I'm certainly no game dev expert, so I had to look it up, but splat maps are used in texture splatting to work with texture transparency. And yeah, I guess that's what was being tested here on these tiles. There's also some oddly placed textures on the wall here, and I'm not quite sure what that's about. I don't feel qualified to add anything else about this map, but if you have any more insight, let us know down in the comments. And now last but absolutely not least, we have Dev Puzzle Environment 2, and as the name might suggest, this level has testing areas for a whole bunch of puzzles. When first loaded into this map, we start way up high on this platform where we can see a bunch of floating waypoint graphics. They don't do anything in particular, and there's not really much else here besides some invisible collision, so yeah, I guess this was just a spot for testing how these would work. Now this test map doesn't really shine until we drop down into this funky looking area below, and here is where the interesting stuff starts. First up, I guess as a test for the new train that was introduced in this game, we actually have the placeholder version of the train from Poppy Playtime Chapter 2 that we saw back in the beta version. Pretty cool to see it back here, but kinda strange that they didn't go with the one that was used in the final. I guess maybe this stuff was being worked on before Chapter 2 was even finished. 
Then next we have this generator here with two blue hand scanners. As you might expect, after placing a hand on each scanner and scanning away, this will turn on the generator and the light will change from red to green, indicating the successful powering up. Now, powering up generators, of course, did make its way into the final version of Project Playtime and must be used when the monster sabotages the survivors. But the generators obviously got a visual overhaul, and there's only one blue hand scanner now instead of the two. Then next up, there's this lone red gear chilling on the floor, and it definitely looks like the intention here was to bring this gear over to this machine to repair it, as it's obviously missing a gear. But no matter what I did, the machine just wouldn't accept this gear, so I guess either this isn't what you were supposed to do, or it just wasn't fully programmed here yet. Also, this area has three of these red buttons that when pushed cause a barrier to slam down to block your path. And this looks to be a test of the closable doors used in the game by the survivors to block the monsters. And similarly, there's also this section where this button causes the bridge to come down for a few seconds. Now this isn't really a mechanic that's seen in the game, at least not yet, but maybe something like this will get added in future updates. Then next up, in addition to seeing some very realistic looking trees, we can actually see three red objectives on this map to complete. The first of these is just another generator, and after completing it we can see that the objective icon changes color from red to green as well. Then the next puzzle to complete is a pressure pad, and here we can see a red box frame similar to the wind cube that I mentioned earlier that was unused in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2. Here you simply have to move this red box onto this plate here to complete the challenge, and like I alluded to earlier, I think this is likely what might have been once introduced in the tutorial level with the red box that we found out of bounds. And lastly, we have yet another pressure plate, but this time seemingly requiring three survivors to stand on it, as indicated by this sign. Although, surprisingly, when standing in the middle, it would apparently count as two people, no matter what else I did, without another person here, I couldn't get it to count to three. Now, I haven't been able to confirm this, but I have a suspicion that when all three of these tasks were completed, this large door here would lift up, as this door seems to block off the rest of this area. I find it interesting that, seemingly, only one of these tasks has been implemented into the current release of Project Playtime. And that's pretty much it for this dev test room. It's super cool to not only be able to see this map left in the game, but to also be able to play around and test the objects myself was a lot of fun. And if you know me, I love me my test room, so this was an absolute joy to see here. Alright, so to start, there are a whole bunch of cosmetic items in the game that I have that aren't currently publicly accessible. Now, I don't want this to come off as a brag, but I was given access to all of the cosmetics in the game so I could show them off in my stream when the game first came out. Yeah, I definitely don't think the devs know how I break open their games the way I do. Anyways, I made a little chart of all of the items I have, and then crossed out what is currently accessible in the game's battle pass, as well as a few of the daily deals I saw before the video went live. Now most of the more basic stuff like most of the masks, shoes, pants, and monster skins will be coming soon, be it in a future battle pass or store bundle, but I wanted to quickly show you guys some highlights of what's to come. For the hats, there's a jack-o'-lantern head, and I reckon this was meant to have released around Halloween time, and it might not until next Halloween, which as of the making of this video is still quite far away. As such, this makes me want to speculate that maybe originally there were plans to release this game before Halloween this year. Then, as far as hands go, there's a cool legendary rare gold gauntlet, a dinner plate set where some utensils replace the fingers, there's a hand with a bunch of graffiti on it, a Mickey Mouse style glove hand, a wooden hand, as well as this one that's made in a voxel style. This one's one of my favorites. Then, strangely enough, although anime girl hair was added to the battle pass, there's also an anime girl dress, socks, as well as shoes. A lot of the other things you get in the Battle Pass come as an outfit bundle where you get all the parts, so it's kinda lame that so far you can only get the hair, and I guess the rest will eventually appear in the store or in the next Battle Pass or something. Next, I've heard rumors that this legendary rare mob hoodie is only supposed to be available for developers of the game. This ruby skin is really cool, I think. And there's also a cool party grab pack that's not obtainable yet, and this changes your guns to a bunch of solo cups, and your pack is covered in disposable paper plates and party decorations. 
There's also a few emotes that you can't currently obtain. There's a clapping one, a nervous finger touch one, as well as one of my favorites, spinning hands. Then, as far as the monster skins go, all of the really cool ones like Chicken Nuggy Feet here are in the Battle Pass, and besides just basic color swaps, only like the silver versions of each monster aren't currently obtainable, as well as the Black Widow skin for Mommy Longlegs, which I think is pretty cool. And although I seemingly have all of the skins in the game, there are actually a few more referenced or found partially in the files that I actually don't have either. The first of these is a cosmic hand type, and this one doesn't have a thumbnail graphic for it in the files, so besides assuming it's going to be cosmic in nature based on the name, we don't really have a good idea of what it's going to look like. And then secondly, I mentioned it briefly in my first video, but there are graphics as well as a unique model for a Buggy Wuggy skin for Huggy, where he will appear in a much lower poly form, and I gotta say, this will probably be my favorite skin. But yeah, like I said, I'm 99.92% .92 sure that most of, if not all of these skins will be eventually obtainable, so keep your eyes peeled, it's probably only a matter of time. And now, for the rest of this video, we'll be taking a look at several 3D models, as well as some textures that are left over normally unused in the files of the game, at least as of the current update that's available at the time of making this video. And I say normally unused, as many of these are actually found in the unused levels that we went over in my last video, so some of them might look familiar to you if you've watched it. Anyways, pretty much all of these are tucked away in a folder titled Deprecated. Yes, the developers spelled deprecated wrong, there are actually several instances where spellcheck would have come in handy, like for conveyor blets here. And despite being found in the deprecated folder, a number of these models do seem to still be used, so I'm going to try and pick apart which ones are and aren't used, at least mostly. There are a whole bunch of miscellaneous things like storage shelf base, or some machinery parts that frankly aren't that interesting, so I'll be skipping them in this video. First up, we got an early version of the toy deposit chute flipped. Now, although the tubes can be seen on either side of the machine in the game, this one appears to be early since it has a blue trim around the monitor, it's also lacking the overhang thing on top of the screen, the plate on the right side is in a different spot, and it just looks a little more rough around the edges in general, figuratively and literally. Also related to the toy deposit machines, there's this black cube that also is listed as a toy deposit. I guess, just based on the name, this black cube might have been a really early placeholder for the toy deposits earlier on in development. Then next up we have this model known as Toy Machine, and this actually appears to be a leftover from Chapter 1 of Poppy Playtime, as it appears that this is the base for one of the machines seen in the Toy Factory room there, but here without the eyes and such. Both featuring a toy factory area, this machine might have once been planned to make a return in the factory map here, or it was at least used as a placeholder. Then next up we got a whole bunch of now unused models that were once used in the early version of the theater map. We have an early version of the dome used for the ceiling, an arch for the stage, some track lighting, play stairs, maybe stairs meant to be used in a play that would be seen on the theater stage or something, we got the clouds and backdrop we saw in the early theater map, some curtains which I don't think were even seen there, the placeholder chairs we saw, and then there's also a bigger model of the entire main theater room. Also seen in the early version, we have the old signs for the train station, the theater itself as was reused from chapter 1, as well as this welcome sign used in the ticketing area of the theater. And of course, I can't forget about the really creepy Huggy that was seen on the early stage, and I believe this is also a remnant left over from Chapter 1. Now before we move on to the next maps, left over normally unused are models of a computer, as well as some security cameras that were seen throughout the early maps, including the one that was enlarged as a placeholder for the theater projector. Now I didn't mention this in my previous video, since I thought nothing of it at the time, but found out of bounds was this desk setup with a bunch of monitors. I'll talk about this a bit more in my next video, but it turns out that similar to how the cameras work in Amogus, there would have been a computer section in the map where a player could interact with it to channel some Five Nights at Freddy's energy, and look through some security cameras, I guess to see where the monster was. This doesn't seem super useful in a Dead by Daylight based game like this, so I can see why it was scrapped, but it does seem like a decent amount of work was put into this mechanic. Now moving on to the early version of the Toy Factory, we saw the placeholder models used for the railings here. And interestingly enough, these railings used are actually meant to be for a hospital bed, so this is kinda weird. 
Then moving on to parts seen in the early version of the Foundry or Steel Mill map, which should be coming to the game in the future, we got it all from the big crucible in the center area of the map, various machine parts, the wheels, the fans, and pretty much all the rest of the stuff found around the area. I'm fairly certain these are just placeholders and there will be proper models when the map is fully introduced, or at the very least they will be given some textures. Then back to the menus, you might have noticed that in the background of the toy box screen there are two cutouts, one of Huggy as well as one of Boogiebot. Well, there's actually one more cutout left in the files that isn't seen here and I don't think it's seen anywhere else in the game, and that's this one with Huggy in a hard hat holding a hammer as we've seen in previous chapters of Poppy Playtime. In my last video, I also went over a developer test map where, yeah, there are a few more objects that never made it into the maps normally seen in the current build. These include this pressure pad display post, as well as this fella that was used on it to indicate how many people were standing on the pressure pad. There's a model of the placeholder buttons that were used to test the walls coming down, as well as the cut bridge mechanic. This workshop machine thing ended up getting scrapped, and lastly we have this thing listed as a lobby background. Now in my last video, I mentioned that I thought these floating things that were seen on this lobby background in the test map were a test of the waypoint graphics, but now seeing and knowing what this platform is called, it's looking more like this was actually a test of how the lobbies once looked like in the game. And that makes more sense too, as these plus box graphics are also similar to the one seen on the main menu and will be coming soon. So yeah, I guess initially, as players would join a lobby, their character would pop up on screen in certain spots, much like in Dead by Daylight, and you could likely click on these boxes to invite a player. And again, we'll talk about this more in my next video, but yeah, this is basically confirmed by some early gameplay footage. Then moving away from the stuff found in the unused maps, there are also a few more models that I don't think I've seen elsewhere. We've got this window that seems to use a similar texture to other unused objects I've covered from previous Poppy games. And then we also have this wooden box that appears to be almost the same as the one I mentioned that is found out of bounds in the survivor tutorial stage in my last video. Although I did think that this might have been meant for a scrapped puzzle mechanic, as a few of you let me know in the comments, it looks like this box was once planned to open using this handle and then a player could hide inside of it, perhaps an early version of the locker hiding system. Now I don't recall seeing this anywhere else, but here we got a P-Penny. Just speculating a bit here, but pennies being a type of coin, this might have been an old 3D model for the in-game purchasable currency before it was renamed to Playcoins. Next up, the early placeholder model of the survivor characters that we saw left over unused back in Poppy Chapter 2 actually returns here. At first, frankly, I didn't think much of this model, but it turns out that there's actually an animation that was added for it that we didn't originally see. And this animation is for the charge roll move that the survivors have in this game to quickly gain a boost of speed. So it looks like this animation was probably added sometime not long after the release of Chapter 2. Then to add to this, although these spiderwebs are seen in the game when Mommy Longlegs shoots them out, I was surprised to see that I was able to load the animations of the placeholder survivor model onto the spiderwebs. And the results are, uh, pretty unsettling to say the least. Yeah, this makes me feel pretty uncomfortable. And last up, speaking of character moves and such, there's actually a leftover graphic of a seemingly scrapped move for the survivors where they would... use a rifle? Yep, matching up with the other UI graphics for character moves, it looks like maybe at one point the survivors could also strap up. Based on how the game looks and plays, I don't see this coming back to the game, but honestly, I just find the idea of it pretty funny. Now really quick, before we get to the behind the scenes goods, I just want to go over a few things I forgot to mention in my previous video in regards to some more stuff left over unused in the files of the game. First, I went over a whole bunch of currently unobtainable cosmetics, but there are a few more that, just like the cosmic hands that I mentioned, only have text references remaining, so we don't really quite know what they're gonna look like besides speculating based on their name. So for the grab packs, there are three unused variants, each which just have a blank icon graphic, a fish tank, a rainbow pack, as well as a galaxy grab pack, I guess to go with the cosmic hands I mentioned in my previous video. But yeah, although all three of these technically do have icon graphics, they unfortunately are just blank. Then speaking of the rainbow pack, there's also a pair of files referencing rainbow skins for both Huggy as well as Boxy. 
And much like the packs, unfortunately the one for Huggy Wuggy just defaults to his normal blue fur here. So yeah, I guess maybe these just weren't quite ready yet to be put in the game. Next up, this image isn't actually found in the files, but it was shared by one of the developers in the game's Discord server, and here we have this screenshot of several players in the game, I assume testing out the multiplayer features. And if it wasn't obvious already, everyone here opted to complete the Walter White look. What's even more interesting about this image though is that almost all of the players are using the fabled flipping the bird emote that I originally discussed back in my chapter 2 videos of Poppy Playtime. In my recent videos on Project Playtime, I've went over how this middle finger emote has seemingly been cut from the game, but as of whenever this screenshot was taken, I guess it was still in play. I assume this emote was removed because it might have been deemed too offensive to their targeted younger demographics, but who knows, maybe one day we'll see this make its way back into the game. And lastly for the graphics left over, in the current release we have some early UI test graphics as well as several thumbnail graphics meant for the level select screen that seem to show off a few unused early levels. As a small side note, I distinctly made plans to show these off in my last video, so I have no idea how I forgot. But anyways, first are several images seemingly testing out the user interface and heads up display graphics for stuff like the pause menu and winning a game. And we can see that for these, the devs just used a screenshot from Poppy Playtime Chapter 1 as a placeholder to, I guess, test how these graphics would look during gameplay. Another interesting screenshot here shows off an early background for the menus as well as an early blank version of the survivor. But the most interesting part of the screenshot shows off a currently unimplemented mechanic of, I guess, saving presets of customized outfits. This would be extremely handy to be able to save some sets that you like to be able to quickly swap between them instead of having to reselect every part every time. I really hope they end up adding this to the game. And now lastly, like I mentioned earlier, there are several level select thumbnail graphics that appear to show off some early levels that were cut. In addition to what looks like the final thumbnail used for the Toy Factory map as well as the upcoming Steel Mill map that I mentioned in my first video, we also have some test maps featuring a wall cut out of what looks like one of the survivors, a dark night themed outdoors map with a tire swing, an indoor area with a bunch of shelves, a cheery indoor train station like area that really gives me FNAF security breach daycare vibes, there's an area that looks like a golf course, an early thumbnail for the theater map, as well as a graphic for the dev test map that we explored in my first video. In that video I also mentioned how map 1 was the toy factory and map 7 was the theater, so now we can see what all the other stages in between were developed as. Currently as I make this video it only looks like the steel mill is coming in the near future, but hopefully some of the others get added in too, a golf course and dark outdoor map sound awesome. Alright, now let's move on to the main part of this video, the Project Playtime Giga Leak. I'm not sure who originally leaked this folder, but it has a whole bunch of stuff from clean Photoshop files of a bunch of artwork and posters seen in the series, some fonts, logos, and of course like I mentioned, several videos which we'll be mostly looking at later in this video. Also, I've had a few people reach out to me over the last few days asking if this leak is legitimate, and seeing which email addresses were associated with this Google Drive folder, I can assure you this is 100% a legit leak. So first up here, found in the folder for character assets are several reference images and videos showing a 360 degree view of a bunch of the characters from the Poppy series. It seems like every character has the front and side profile images, but only Bunzo Bunny, Huggy, Kissy Missy, Mommy Longlegs, and PJ Pugapillar have the 360 degree view. These were, and I guess still probably are, likely used as references for artists making new drawings of these characters for posters and merch and such. Also found amongst these character assets is this render of Mommy Longlegs, Bunzo, as well as PJ, three of the antagonists that you see in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2. Now at first glance this may not seem like anything special, but both Bunzo and PJ here have a unique bloody look that they are never seen with in the game. In one of my older videos I mentioned how in the beta PJ did use a bloody texture, but this was changed in the final version, and I guess it looks like maybe Bunzo was once planned to have a few stains as well. Then next up, there's a folder with a whole bunch of the posters seen in the Playtime Co. Factory throughout the series. Now again, at first glance, these posters might not seem like that much of an interesting thing to talk about here, but some of them actually hide some pretty interesting things in their Photoshop files. For instance, in this poster of Cat B and Candy Cat hanging onto a branch, we can find some hidden original line art where we can see a sketch of Candy Cat with a much shorter tongue than how it's seen in the final version of the poster. 
then arguably even more interesting, found hidden in some layers in a few other posters like this one of BoogieBot, there are several instances of what looks like reference images used for making these posters. There's a very old poster of a Toys R Us parade of stars, and then there's some comic book cover art for Casper and Wendy, weird tales of terror, horrific, as well as everyone's favorite, little sad sack. But yeah, I guess the artists use these images as references and inspiration for making the Poppy Playtime posters in the style of comics and toys of decades past. Another interesting thing is that we can also find some old sketches here, one of Braun, as well as this old sketch of what eventually became a poster of Kissy Missy. I thought it was pretty cool to see this artwork at such an early stage before it was finalized. And one last thing found in the posters folder that I want to go over here is a file titled Poster Backsides. Now, at first I was like, wait, you never end up seeing the backsides of any posters in the game. And then it hit me. Wait, there's no way that these were part of the NFT deposit. Yup, that's exactly what these are. One of the biggest controversies this series has faced was the introduction of these NFTs, and yeah, I now literally just have the Photoshop file of them. Wild. Then next up, found in the root folder of the leak are a pair of interesting images that I don't think I've seen anywhere else. The first of these is a poppy flower, similar to what's seen at the end of chapter 1 when getting to the poppy room, but interestingly, this one has a creepy eye at the center, it almost kinda looks like Krakow, a boss from the Kirby series. Then next is a large image of the Playtime Company factory listed as LP Banner. Now at first I thought this was just an early placeholder version of the Chapter 1 background like we saw in my previous videos, but then I started seeing some numbers and I realized there was more to this image than meets the eye. Around the factory you can find the numbers 9, 14, 6, 5, 18, 14 again, 21, and 13. And following the pattern that we recently saw in Bendy and the Dark Revival, this is an incredibly easy cipher where a number directly equals a letter in the alphabet known as the A1Z26 cipher, A being 1, B being 2, and so on. So if we decode this message, the following word can be revealed, Infernum. And Infernum is a Latin word that apparently translates to underground, depths of the earth, or of course, hell. Now this message is really contrasting with the cheery nature of the rest of this image, but I guess that's what the whole series is about here. Alright, and now for the real good stuff, there's a folder in the leak titled simply BTS. And we ain't talking K-pop here, but this folder contains a metric boatload of behind the scenes videos and images, often giving us a really cool peek into the development of this game. First up, let's talk about the images that are found here, starting with a bunch of concept art. For the survivor side of things, there's concept art for the Plague Doctor mask, as well as this concept art for the ninja outfit. Then we have some renders of the electrical hand, as well as a pair of renders that were used on the game's Twitter page. Interestingly, for this second one, there's also an alternate version where the survivor on the floor is seen in a boxy outfit instead of the spacesuit. Then we got some concept art for several boxy skins including Cardboard, Vault, and Box Shibu. And then there's also a seemingly really early concept sketch for Boxy in general, where we can also see that someone crudely sketched in the top part of the box in red here. Next, there are two images of a render of Boxy, both which look pretty odd. In the first one here, Boxy has creepy big eyes and has an even more disturbing smile. Honestly, I think this is scarier than any of the other skins in the game. Then, basically the opposite of this, in this image, Boxy's smile was forcibly turned into a frown, and his eyes were shrunken down. Yeah, this just about matches how I feel about this picture too. Then next we got a mixed bag of various images. There's a nice close-up of Mommy Longlegs with a creepy smile, a screenshot of a few Portal Lounge lockers, some wacky scene with all three monsters, there's an awkward screenshot of Boxy, and then an even more awkward image of Huggy with a derpy face, and I guess his torso is just gone? And on the topic of Huggy, there's also this image of a model of a Wuggy crawling through one of the pipes, and this appears to be a different model than those that are used in the game. In the game, the models are basically just a smaller Huggy, and yeah, this one definitely seems lankier and seems to have a different face. Then next here are a handful of screenshots taken throughout several points in the game's development. And first, there's a screenshot of what looks to be from a really, really early point in development. At first I didn't think this was anything but a really early test map, but based on this name, Blockout Map 1, this was eventually turned into what became the factory map, so I guess this is just a really early version of that. 
Then there's this screenshot from a later version of the Toy Factory, and here, interestingly, on this wall, we can see references to two puzzle doors, as well as a puzzle position. In the current release of the game, the puzzles are all seen on these towers, so perhaps this was from a point in development where the puzzles were going to be placed on walls instead, and would feature a pair of doors. Then next up, there's a screenshot of the early version of the theater map, and here we can also see some stand-ins for the survivors and Huggy, but even more interestingly, on the side here we can see the wooden box with the red trim that I've covered in my previous videos. For those that haven't watched those yet, these are basically boxes that players could hide from the monster in, and these seem to have been replaced by the lockers. And then the last image we have here seems to be from a later point in development, as we have cosmetic hands, the final toy shoots, and the final UI graphics implemented. On the other hand though, here we also have the scrapped generator, the cut security system mechanic, it's seen in some test map, oh and we have not one, but two floating trains, so yeah, that's a thing. Also, this train seemingly has a slide running from its caboose down to the map, so perhaps this train was actually a playable part of the level here as well. Now, screenshots and images are fine and all, but now saving the best for last, this leak also has several video clips to check out, and man are they ever cool. I wasn't kidding in my previous video, this just might be the most insight into a game's development we've ever covered on this series. Just like the images, these videos appear to span from very early on in development to only a few days before the initial early access release. So, starting with some of the earlier stuff, the earliest video was made on January 10th, 2022, almost a whole year before the initial release of Project Playtime, and even several months before the release of Poppy Playtime's Chapter 2. So it looks like soon after Chapter 1 was released, the devs already started developing this multiplayer mode. This first video appears to be a very early proof of concept for the multiplayer experience as we can see incredibly basic placeholder models of each character, and we can also see both players' perspectives as one keeps grabbing at these cubes. We can also see that the grab pack hands don't even have a cable here and are just floating when launched. The next video was made just over a week later dubbed Funny Bugs, and here we can see the player launching several sets of hands at some cubes which I guess completely busted the physics and sent the boxes flying. Now that's cool in its own right, but if we slow down the footage we can also see a few more things in this test room. There's a pair of coils, a sunny buddy, a computer and a desk, as well as another computer and another desk, but this time there's a certain someone sitting behind it. And this is actually the taxi driver guy that was seemingly scrapped back in Chapter 1 of Poppy Playtime as I covered in my previous videos. No idea why he's here, but maybe you might know what he's watching on his computer. Either way, I thought it was super funny to see him implemented not driving a taxi as we thought, but here just chilling at his desk instead. Then recorded only a few days after this is a clip simply titled Better Quality, and I guess this was referring to the player models as once again testing the multiplayer aspects. Here a proper model for both the survivor and monster were implemented. This clip also shows off a bunch of the early taunts and we can also see the old UI graphics, both of which we saw left over in Chapter 2 of Poppy Playtime. The rest of this clip also reveals another early test map with a bunch of boxes, a really early version of the train I don't think we've seen anywhere before, as well as a cafeteria room. This clip also shows off three little puzzles that each, when completed, would change one of these red lights to green, and once all three were completed, this door would also open. We can see a pair of pressure plate puzzles, as well as the gear puzzle, all of which we saw in the unused dev map left in the current build of Project Playtime. But unlike in the map that we saw, the gear puzzle actually seems to work here, and it's just how I predicted, you basically just had to bring the missing gear over to the machine. But for whatever reason, this didn't work in the map that's left in the game. Maybe the machine being halfway underground had something to do with it. In any case, this looks like a pretty sweet little test room. I wish this one had remained left over for us in the game as well. The next, recorded on January 31st, 2022, is a short video that looks to show off that an ability for Mommy Longlegs to climb walls was added. This seems to be a scrapped ability as, although Mommy Longlegs can extend a limb to zip to almost any surface, she can't just climb up walls like this, and I guess it's a good thing too. She doesn't need to be more broken than she already is. And speaking of the grapple ability, this doesn't seem to be from around the same time yet, but there's also this very short clip that appears to be testing it. 
yeah, it definitely doesn't look like Mommy's model during this action was ready for this yet. And if we pause here, at whatever point in development this video was recorded, we can see a new yet still different from the final version set of UI graphics were used. We can see a checklist of the toy parts in the top left here with renders for each part, as opposed to up at the top center with simplified graphics as is seen in the current version, and the UI graphic for the special charge roll move here appears much different as it's just an upwards pointing arrow instead of a graphic of a survivor. Then next up, recorded in early February of 2022 is a clip where it appears that this is around when the first functioning train was added to the game. It still uses the old beta version of the train, but here the player could already enter and ride inside of it. We can also briefly get a look at another test map, and this looks to be map 3 as we saw with the unused thumbnail graphics earlier. This is, I think, the only other glimpse we ever get of this map, so unfortunately, aside from this and the thumbnail graphic, we can't really know what the rest of it looks like at this point. Then, a month later, a video titled First Session Ever was recorded, and this shows off a dev running two separate versions of the game on two separate Steam accounts, and as the name implies, this was the first ever true multiplayer session of the game. And whoever the developer is here seems to be pretty happy that it ended up working out. That is a successful connection. Interestingly, although the menu UI graphics actually appear to be the same as how they're seen in the current release, we can also see thumbnails of a few of the unused levels on the level select screen, and then we also see a very early and basic looking title screen with different menu graphics, a really basic placeholder survivor, and at this point the game still had a simple placeholder title of just Poppy Playtime Multiplayer Edition. Then, almost two months after this point, we have another video where the game seems to have been much further along. And like I teased in my last video, this clip shows off a security camera mechanic that, as of right now, is scrapped from the game. Basically, a player, or monster in this case, could approach one of these monitoring stations and then could access the security cameras around the maps, basically adding some FNAF flair to this game. This mechanic doesn't really seem that useful in a Dead by Daylight asymmetrical style of game like this one from both the monster and survivor perspective, so I can see why this was removed, but nonetheless, it definitely seems like a decent amount of work was put into this mechanic. And yeah, the Bunzo army area is pretty creepy and definitely needs to be added in a future map. So there's around a 5 month gap from this video until the next one that's dated, I guess since this was around the time that Poppy Playtime Chapter 2 was released. So now let's check out a few clips that are left undated in this leak. First is this short clip where we can see a whole bunch of miscellaneous objects in a brightly lit outdoor environment. We got some floating boxes and balls, what looks like some sort of distillery machine, the T-posing metallic survivor, as well as some sort of reflective globs moving towards this mirrored surface. This clip is a bit short to really get a sense of what exactly is going on here, but I guess just based on all the reflective surfaces and how they seem to actually be reflecting the map, this might have been a map for testing lighting and ray tracing in the game. And the metallic globs actually seem to be Mommy Longleg's spiderweb shots as we can see the meter deplete as they're used. On that note, we can also see more of the early UI graphics that I mentioned earlier, and although the icon for the spotter move appears to be the same, the webshot graphic is a bit different, and also it looks like the heart counter was once in the top right instead of the bottom left of the screen as is seen in the release version. Next is a short clip featuring the wooden red box and the ability to open it before hiding inside of it, and then there's also a goofy clip of some players spinning around really fast in some chairs with Matt from IT here changing colors every once in a while too. There aren't any chairs like this in the game to interact with, but maybe this was part of the security camera mechanic where the player could sit in one of these chairs. And yeah, I absolutely want chair spinning like this to return as a lobby waiting area mechanic. Next is a really weird clip, as it appears to show the player playing as both a survivor and Huggy at the same time, as the player uses the grab pack to grab another survivor, before swinging at it with Huggy's hands. The grab pack also seems to have a cooldown, so maybe this was used as a test for implementing Huggy's charge move or something like that. Also, this video seems to show off even earlier UI graphics, as here Pi and J are used as placeholders for the special moves. And if you have a keen eye, you might recognize these symbols as being the same ones that are used in the Simon Says minigame in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2. 
Next, in addition to just a quick look at an early version of the Wuggy Pit, or Woo Log as my pal Spiff calls it from the Survivor tutorial stage, there's a pair of short clips where we can see the developers were messing around with the size of these survivors. In the first one, we can see Huggy carrying around a comically large fella, and then the second clip features a really small guy. He's trying his best, okay? Also, in the clip with the massive survivor, we can see our first look at an early graphic for the mini Huggy move, and here we can also see an early placeholder for the grapple bars. The last pair of undated clips are both pretty short, this time showing off what I can only describe as a swarm of bees. And the second of these clips is even scarier, as the bees were now replaced with cat bees instead. And at this point, I have no idea what this is for, but it's hella unsettling. Nothing like this is currently seen in the game, but if I was to speculate, at least the bees in this first clip might have been a hazard or something that was meant for the dark outdoors map. And wow, what a segue, as next we have three clips recorded on September 14th, 2022, the first of which here appears to take place in that outdoor map. Titled simply Old 2, here we can see some of the first recorded footage of an actual match taking place in this folder. Oh, and here, the photorealistic grass texture we saw in the early theater map is used a whole bunch, and at this point, it seems like only the two-hand generators were implemented as puzzles. What I wasn't ready for, though, was seeing a large T-posing mommy longlegs chasing the players around. This is definitely giving me flashbacks to the Huggy Jumpscare test room from Chapter 1. The clip later cuts to after the players were able to power up enough generators to then exfil on the train, and hey, there's the win cube that we saw left over in Chapter 2, and it looks like it functions just like we expected. It's so awesome to finally see how all of these objects were meant to be used in developing this game. Next we have Old 1, and like I teased in my previous video, this shows off an early lobby screen where players would pop up as they joined. And here is where the lobby background object that's left over in the current release of the game was used. And we, once again, get to see another unused thing used here as we finally get to see the old monster select screen in action. We've seen this unused and non-functional all the way back in Poppy Chapter 2 and now more recently in the current release of Project Playtime. But it's awesome to finally see this working as we thought it would. And just like we saw in this box in Chapter 2, here only a Happy Huggy and T-Posing Mommy Longlegs are present, so I guess Boxy wasn't implemented at this point in development just yet. Then after this screen, the game loads into the cheery train station area, so we also get to see a brief glimpse into what it looked like. Interestingly, despite being recorded at a later date as some of the clips we've already covered, this clip uses the very old UI graphics for playing as Huggy. Anyways, this map looks really small, bright, and wide open, so it seems like it's really hard to hide from the monster here. If this map ever does get implemented into the game, it's gonna need some serious overhauling, but I think a bright map would be cool to shake things up from the rest of the darker ones. And lastly for the clips dated on this same day is New 1, and this appears to take place in the early version of the theater map. And furthermore, this appears to use the objects that we found out of bounds under the map there, so pretty cool to see those used here too. You can also see a non-functioning mini Huggy that was added around this time, and it looks like the developers were testing Huggy's in-game animations at this point as well. Oh, and once again, the middle finger emote returns, meaning that this was cut from the game within like the last three months. I don't know, I have a really strong feeling that we'll see this added into the game someday. Between this time and the next clips, we can see a few animation tests for both Huggy and Boxy. These include both of them just walking, Huggy running, as well as a test of Boxy's jump scare animation where he's seen chomping on a survivor's neck before slamming him to the ground. Then the next clip is dated November 23rd, so only like three weeks before this game was released, and only about a month before I'm making this video. And this short clip shows that the final version of the monster selection menu was implemented and the much scarier model of Huggy was added instead of the smiley one used before. And now, nearing within a week of the game's early access release, well, at least when it was initially supposed to release, there's three more clips that were recorded on December 1st, 2022. Being so close to the release, there's no longer anything cool from earlier in the game's development here, but rather we get some pretty cool cinematic looks at Mecha Mommy Longlegs, the hot pack and hands, as well as the whole skeleton outfit with the skeleton pack and hands as well.
Honestly, I think this leak is one of the craziest things I've gotten to cover on Lost Bits. I thought leaving behind a whole beta build in Chapter 2 of Poppy Playtime was the most wild thing, but hey, here we are. We basically got an inside look into the entire development history of this game, from its early beginnings of just barely being a multiplayer game, to where it is now. And it was especially awesome to see all of the unused stuff that we've been covering over the past few months, and how they were once implemented in developing this game. I don't know if we'll ever get as deep of an insight into a major game's development like this ever again, but I certainly hope so, because this was an absolute blast for me. So about two months after initially dropping in a totally ready state... Oh, I'm watching you, you're like, AJ, where are you, are you dude? Of the roof? <laughs> I don't know where I am. Oh. You're like... Oh, hey? yeah. That's not a good sign. Right. getting the kill on... Did I just die? <laughs> on February 13th, 2023, the developers of Project Playtime have dropped a new update, just in time for Valentine's oh. Day. Now, in addition to a new intro cinematic, as well as a Valentine's Day themed event, and of course some more cosmetic items to buy, who would have seen that coming, there are also a few new changes to the game's files, namely a big update to the unused steel mill map that we discussed in some of my previous videos. So stick around, beat up that like button below, let's check out some more Project Playtime Lost Bits. Alright, now first, before we get to the main part of this video with the new unused map, there's a few smaller things that I want to touch on. For starters, the unused low-poly Buggy Wuggy skin for Huggy Wuggy that we went over in my previous videos has been seemingly made playable by some fans modifying the game. It's still not added in full, as even as someone that does have access to all of the cosmetics in the game courtesy of the devs, I still can't even see this skin in my inventory. Buggy Wuggy was apparently the first monster skin that was implemented into the game and was never meant to actually be a skin that players could see or have access to. And unfortunately, even though some of the devs have mentioned their intention to just keep it as a private dev-only skin, kind of like how the mob games hoodie that I somehow have, I'm still hoping that one day we do see this low poly fella accessible to the public. It's honestly pretty creepy, but on the flip side, the first person view when playing as Huggy this way just looks hilarious. Then next, Project Playtime also got a few smaller changes including finally implementing at least some form of anti-cheat, and the player model also got an update, now seemingly having updated joints and a different texture making it look slightly more worn down than before. There's new coding in the game that appears to show that the ability to create presets for your character's cosmetic loadout is being worked on, something that was seemingly removed from the game from earlier builds. There's also this currently unused trash bin icon, as well as this one that looks to be a placeholder simply listed as a trap ability icon, where we can just see a crudely drawn X over the cube below which is otherwise seen when no sabotage is equipped when playing as a monster. Currently, it's not 100% clear what this placeholder graphic was meant for. And now for the best part of this update, like I mentioned earlier, a new unused map has been added into the files of the game. And I say new like that since although this is a new and unique map, it actually appears to be an updated remake of the Steel Mill map as I covered in my previous videos. And if you haven't seen those, yeah, this is the next upcoming map that's seen as coming soon on the map selection screen. Anyways, right off the bat, the working name for this map has been changed from Steel Mill to Recycle Mill instead, and the reason for this will be pretty clear soon. Now, overall, this map looks pretty similar to the previous Steel Mill map, but the scale of this new map is much larger, and yeah, although still obviously not quite complete, this map does look much more polished. For one, although still lacking most textures and stuff, the lighting here already looks quite great, with a bunch of lighting coming from this large central blast furnace thing, where currently, the melted material is still static, but I reckon this will be animated for the release version of this map. The lighting and shadows here, yeah, I'm a big fan. Now another thing you'll notice as we fly around here is that not only are some of the walls colored blue, but a bunch of them will also display some text in the middle as well. Now we haven't seen this in the game before, but this basically just indicates which face of the geometry is facing outwards, as well as the length, width, and height of each unit, here seen in centimeters. And speaking of text that we can see around the map, much like the text we saw in the original Steel Mill map, 
Here too, we can find more text floating around that gives us some more context into how some areas are planned to function or what they will eventually be made into. For example, here we can see some text explicitly just indicating that, eventually, a bunch of pipes and valves are meant to be implemented here. On the flip side, some text is less than clear. For example, here, where the text is actually partially obscured by this wall, it says, Material to be blast furnace staging open wall a bit stretch goal. Now, although maybe not worded the best, I think this is saying that this area will be some sort of staging area where the material that is to be sent to the blast furnace will be consolidated first. But being listed as a stretch goal, I guess this may or may not end up actually coming to fruition. I suppose only time will tell. And what exactly is the material that is going to be blast furnace, you might be wondering? Well, unlike in the previous steel mill map, where it seemed like basically only steel was going to be melted down and processed there, here we actually do have some text indicating that this map instead would melt down reject toys to recycle them, and we'd see areas with dumpsters full of discarded toys. Kinda sad, really. So yeah, remember Sir poops -a -lot and all those other toys seen in that one room in Poppy Playtime Chapter 2? Well, looks like this is their ultimate fate. And based on the fact that the toys are now being recycled here and it's not just a generic steel mill area, it should be a little more clear as to why this is now called a recycle mill instead of just a steel mill. Now one other bit of floating developer text can be found up here, and this one mentions a yet-to-be-implemented grapple that can be used to escape a mezzanine area in the map. Now, without being able to actually play on this map yet, I feel like I don't have enough context yet to make any more sense of just how this grapple will work. Now, that's a quick breakdown of all the more notable stuff found in Bounds, but there are also a whole bunch of things found outside of the walls of the regular play area down here. For starters, we got the essentials like the lobby waiting area up here, as well as the area that's used for the monster selection screen where all three monsters can be seen loaded in at the same time. Then, far off from the lobby area is this large chunk of geometry. I can't really tell what this is meant to be outside of just a wall or something. And similarly, outside of one of the map's train station areas is a bunch of shapes where we can also see some glowing hot slabs of presumably material that was processed at this mill. Just based on how they're kinda laid out here, my best guess is that this is some sort of really early conveyor system that was whipped up for moving these slabs along. I guess it was replaced or canned pretty quickly though due to how basic it appears here. Next, found under the map is a mishmash of different things. We have this chunk of level geometry that has some walls and windows and such. There's a random single arm of the chandelier that's seen in the theater map found down here for whatever reason. And then, as we look even lower, not only can we see the Wulog pit area for this map ready to go, below it are several large platforms in a bunch of different colors. Nothing like this has been seen in any of the other maps in the game, both used or unused. So yeah, I'm not really sure what the intention is with these and why they're seen here in different colors. If you have any knowledge about this, be sure to let us know down in the comments. And that's not all, as lastly found just under these planes is another weird structure. At first I thought it might have been an early model of the Wuggy Pit, but upon closer inspection, seeing these pipe-like parts, it's more likely that it's some sort of early version of the main blast furnace section of the map. Anyways, it's super cool to see that the Steel Mill map got such a big update, but although it still says coming soon on the level selection screen, seeing how unfinished this is still, it may be a few more months till this makes it to the game. Although there's not too much left in the game in terms of unused content anymore, the developers of this game also shared a folder with several images showing us a behind-the-scenes look at developing some of these cosmetic items. Now, for the most part, these are just renders of the various items from different angles like the foot hand, the retro-futuristic grab pack, a bunch of the outfits including the prison, crash test dummy, wolf, and reject toy ones, there are some renders of the new hair items, Candy Mommy in a really creepy looking T-pose, and more. And in addition to all of these, there are also some conceptual sketches and models revealing an even earlier look for some of these skins. 
For the concept sketches, we have one for the CRT Survivor skin, the Retro Future, Furnace, Steampunk, Barry and Harambe grab packs, and then sketches for several additional items and how they would theoretically look on a player. Then there are some sketches of the wolf costume testing different facial expressions, as well as different facial expressions for the new digital huggy mask. There's designs for the CRT grab pack with an image that was used for reference. There's what appears to be some early designs for the balloon pump grab pack. Early sketches for the balloon hands, where it looks like one of the plans was for the hands to turn into balloon animals or a huggy face as well as there's early designs for the lasagna hands. There are also concept sketches for a few of the monster skins where we can see some alternate designs for the Scarecrow Huggy, a concept sketch of Glutinous Huggy, we can see alternate colors for the Tree Hugger Huggy, different ideas for the CRT Boxy skin, including it seemingly being more so based on a computer with a floppy disk slot on its body or Pong being played on the TV, and also different concepts for the head, either being another monitor or what looks like a gamepad instead of the record player as is used in the final version. There's also concept sketches for Mommy Candy with images of candy for reference, as well as design sketches for Boxy Clown, including a really creepy image that I guess was used for reference. Then this folder also contains some screenshots of other stuff, including renders of more items and characters, a close-up of Huggy's bow tie, some work-in-progress renders of Huggy, alternate head designs for Glutinous Huggy where different levels of cheese and or blood were used for his mouth, some more screenshots of developing Huggy, a creepy red one, as well as some in-game screenshots of Huggy in the new item store area, as well as this screenshot that basically confirms the Breaking Bad references. Now to my delight, there are also some behind-the-scenes videos here as well. There's a video showing off how the Puzzle Pillar Phase 2 Grab Pack Gun works, which, side note, the colors here really remind me of the original Legend of Zelda game. A video of the Puzzle Pillar Phase 1 pack in action, as well as a more in-depth one showing off all the little details going on with the Steampunk Grab Pack, which I thought was really cool to see up close like this. There's a video of CRT Boxy in an idle animation, and then a strange video of a survivor running in place with the Future Retro Pack equipped. Although if you blink you'll miss it, if we slow things down we can see that this was recorded in what looks like some sort of test room with basic geometry, what appears to be a bunch of floating hands and grab packs, as well as some parts of the newly added map. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that any sort of dev map like this was shipped with the latest update to the game though. And lastly, for this behind the scenes folder, it appears to reveal a single survivor skin that hasn't yet been added, well at least not in this way. So this is apparently, according to the title of this video here, a steampunk skin for the survivor, and there's also this screenshot of it in an exploded view. Now there is a steampunk skin in the game, but it looks quite different, and frankly way less interesting than this one with all the cool gears and everything spinning inside. And much like the video of the steampunk grab pack, which by the way way better suits this skin, this video also shows off some nice close-ups of all the little details. It appears that there was quite a lot of work put into making this skin tick, so honestly, I have no idea why the steampunk skin was changed to the one we got instead. I mean, maybe they'll add this to the game in the future, but seeing as how there's already another named steampunk skin, I guess they just have to call it something else. And furthermore, the model for this skin is also still in the game, which I think is even extra strange. Next, interestingly enough, I was finally able to equip the fish tank grab pack. Well, sort of. Unfortunately, I guess there's no working model for it yet, so it just results in an invisible pack, which is kinda cool in its own right. Now I brought this fish tank up as an unused grab pack several months ago, but it looks like they're still working on getting it added into the game. Now next, for the lone unused graphic that I want to touch on here, we have this. Now this deep fried texture of the scout from TF2 that's been used in some memes was actually found in the game's files for a bit starting with I believe the Valentine's Day update but was later removed in the next St. Patrick's Day event update to the game in March of 2023. It's listed as a test texture but I have no idea what they could have possibly been testing with a texture like this. Now that's it for the graphics side of things, but left over in the files are also a few jump scare sound effects that appear to reveal currently unimplemented skins for the monsters. There's reference to a Kitty Witty skin for Huggy, a Bomb skin for Boxy, 
and then to complement the voxel skin that Huggy got, there's references to a voxel skin for both Mommy and Boxy as well. Since these sound effects were made, I reckon we should see these added at some point in the future. Now finally onto playing the game itself, one major change with this update was the tutorial stages were redone for both the survivors as well as playing as a monster. Although the main ideas are the same, they take place in new maps, the dialogue is different, and the way you get through it alters as after getting the first toy part here, Huggy will actually be let loose in the area and will be an ongoing threat. Additionally, this survivor tutorial area is now the waiting lobby area at the start of playing a game. Having this area to run around in, and this room with a bunch of puzzles to practice on, definitely beats just waiting in the train station area as it was before. Now unfortunately, there aren't any out of bounds things for us to see in the survivor tutorial map this time around, but thankfully the monster tutorial one has our back. Here, just like in the original version, under each door that segments the different parts of the tutorial, we can see some floating developer text out of bounds that indicates the conditions that have to be met in order for the door to open. These include swiping at the door, which is a new one, placing a huggy sentry, and finally using the sabotage ability near the end of the tutorial. It's not much, but always nice to see this dev text in these games. And unfortunately, that's about all the new ones here, as I wasn't able to find any in the newly added Destroy a Toy level, which we'll get back to in a bit here. Before we do that though, another interesting addition to this update is the ability to change background music that's played when being chased, waiting in the lobby, and more. Now the only reason I bring this up is that some of the chase music absolutely slaps. Here's a quick sample. And now, last up for this video, we of course have the new Destroy a Toy map, and unsurprisingly, it's very similar to how we saw it in the January 2023 updates, only of course, it's way more polished up now. Like I alluded to earlier, unfortunately, there's not all too many secrets in this one, outside of some machinery hidden out of bounds, as well as this ladder found up in this catwalk section which looks a bit too detailed for something that the player can't normally see. And the stage's environment plays out just like how it was planned out all those months ago as we saw in my older videos. From the broken toy graveyard, the toys get processed and melted down, after which they then get formed into some hot metal slabs, which in turn then get rolled up into some large rolls of metal or whatever material this is. And we of course have the large central furnace thing which is now actually animated, and honestly I think it looks great and just mesmerizing to stare at. Other than that, not much else to say about it honestly, but I did go back and looked through an old version of this map which is still left over, and this time I saw this very strange red apparition of Huggy here which I don't think was there before. If anyone knows why this might be here, I'd love to know about it down in the comments. Oh and if you've watched my previous videos and are curious, unfortunately still no Buggy Wuggy skin for Huggy and still no middle finger emote. <laughs> 